do it. It is happening. All right. So it looks like we are now live. Welcome right. back to another episode of Red Dot Forum Camera Talk. I am David Farkas. I'm joined by Josh Lair. And we also have Jose Rivera uh, doing the producing and cameras and all that, giving us questions. Hello, everyone. And uh, hanging out in the comments section, we have Kirsten Vignes and Peter Dooling. So we got the whole team here. Yep. And uh, what are we going to talk about today, Josh? Well, first, uh, hi, everybody. I'm sure you missed us dearly now that we're on a every two week schedule. But mm -hmm. the advantage of that is it gives us the opportunity to collect an impressive array. Uh, of This week, we will be talking about telephoto M lenses from 75 to 135 millimeter. So we'll cover cool. 70 plus years of like a telephoto M lens design and history and we'll mm -hmm. answer a bunch of cool questions. And we have Quite a, quite a lot to discuss and to cover. So, absolutely, yeah, I am. I'm pretty excited. Um, you know, David and I both are big fans of telephoto in general. Um, David has his favorites. I have my favorites. But this is a, a particular topic I think that we're both we're near mm -hmm. and dear to us. For sure. You know, wide angles are fun. Noctiluxes are fun. Crazy stuff is fun. But there's something about using a telephoto, especially in maybe a, what I would call a non-traditional setting. Sure. That really speaks to us, I think, both pretty well. Um, and now, of course, we're lucky enough to have SL2s and CLs and all kinds of cool things we can adapt these lenses to, yeah. which makes them that much more usable. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so last week we covered, uh, what, 16 to uh, 28. This yep. week we're skipping the middle section. And then we were originally going to do 35 and 50. We may now end up splitting 35 and 50 into two separate videos. Yeah, there was some talk about that. So we'll yeah. see. We'll I mean, see. We if, don't know. if you guys have a strong feeling, if, if you want us to just talk about 35 yeah. or just 50. Yeah, let us know. Let us know in the comments. Because um, we don't want to rush. We don't want to skip a bunch of questions. You know, But David and I, as everyone knows, can go on for a very long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. What we lack in brevity, we make up for in... Non in um, <laughs> yeah. yeah the other the Thorough, opposite of that. thoroughness we're very thorough thoroughness exactly so you know there's a lot of things both in terms of hardware and technique and user experience that go into getting the most out of a telephoto mm -hmm. lens whether it's a 75 a 90 or, or a 135 um, and just to sort of reiterate this will be M lenses I know there are some great screw mount lenses and R lenses and we'll probably touch on a couple random things mm -hmm. but this is specific to um, telephoto M lenses. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, like Josh said, definitely, and as we're dedicating an entire episode just to 35s and 50s and maybe two, who knows. Yeah. But, you know, they tend to get all the love in, in like a world. And mm -hmm. then when people go beyond that, they're like, well, I've got my 35, I've got my 50, what do I get next? Most people say wide angle. They go 28, 24, 21. And, um, it seems that the the lovely tellies tend mm -hmm. to get left out. Yeah. You know, people don't necessarily look at this as their their second lens. And a lot of people ask me, you know, hey, what what are your most used lenses? And if I look at my catalog of of what I shoot the most, it would be 35 and 90. Mm -hmm. You know, which is maybe not what people expect. Yeah. I think a lot of people would say, oh, you don't shoot 28 and 50 most. Mm -hmm. No, really, I think 90 is my mo is my second most used lens because it does fill a gap that you really can't replicate with with a wide angle. You know, you can only get so close. Mm. And uh, I really like detail shots and texture mm. and what I like to call, you know, scene setting stuff. So even with with travel photography, I so often will do details of, of artisans' hands or, or faces or look, and it really separates the the subject from the background or yeah. isolates it from a busy background. And I, yeah. I think that's where telephotos, at least for me, mm -hmm. you know, just really shine. Yeah, I would say separation and compression mm -hmm. are two words that come to mind when I think about why I use a telephoto lens over a 50 or a 35 or, or something wider. Because yeah, for sure. It, it does give you a look that you could crop all day, you could do whatever, but it's never going to be the same. Right. You, you can only get that look with a telephoto lens. Absolutely. Um, and again, just for the sake of this video, telephoto is 75 to 135. Obviously, there's lots of lenses that exist in the world, all kinds of crazy stuff, but yep. this is 75 to 135. So I think we've 
probably um, got some good questions that we can answer. Um, we'll give Jose a second to pull up the, the list. Uh, we got some questions we submitted uh, or had submitted ahead of time that we're mm -hmm. going to answer. We're certainly going to be keeping an eye on the comments or the yeah, live chat sure. here in the video. So keep the questions coming in. We're going to try to get to as many as we can. Um, yeah, I'm just taking a quick look through here yeah, while you're, some, you're going. Yeah, you can stuff. see we've oh, got... Oh, yeah, we got all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah, lots and lots and lots. So... Uh, I, I know, all kinds of wow. people. Wow. Okay. Nice. We appreciate it. Everybody keeps tuning in to us babbling on about things. So thank you. <laughs> Jose, I think, is ready. Why don't you start off with a question? Go. All right. <clears throat> Let's start off with a question here. Um, how does the 75 millimeter focal length compare to the 90 millimeter focal length? Hmm. You want to take this one? Yeah, sure. All right. um, so 75 is obviously shorter than 90. <laughs> the higher number means you have a longer focal length, more magnification. You can. So I think there's advantages and disadvantages of both. And and they are they are very close. And I think in a lot of cases maybe interchangeable depending on where you're starting from. So if you have a 35, you might want to jump to a 75. If you have a 50, you may want to go over 75 and go to 90. I think, you know, just like we talked about in the wide angle discussion two weeks ago, what wide angle lens you choose really depends on what your main lens is. And you have a telephoto lens you choose. No, last oh. two weeks ago. Oh, discussion, oh, oh, right, right. Right. okay. Yes, yeah, so I'm just referencing back. <laughs> okay, if you okay, haven't like, seen wait. that, you can, you can check our previous right. video. Part one. Part, part one of, uh, of the M lens discussion was wide angle. Mm -hmm. So, so choosing, you know, because there was a question there of how do I choose between a 21, 24, or 28? And it, it came down to, well, what's your main lens that you're using? And I think the same applies for telephoto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, if you're shooting a 35, a 75 is a really good match for that. If you're shooting 50 main, the 90 is a really good match for that. But there's more to that story, right? Because I've gone out with a 50 and a 75 mm -hmm. because I think they are different enough if that's what you want. So that particular outing, I was using the 75 F2 APO for portraiture, specifically a portrait session, and it just works so well for that. I think that 75 makes, let's say, as an easier portrait lens mm. because you have more comfortable working range with your subject. When you're, with a, when you're shooting with a 90, you have to be a lot further back to get that same kind of framing. So if you're doing head and shoulders or, or waist up, a 90, you're going to be you're going to be a ways back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and that that can be a disadvantage of maintaining, you know, that communication and connection with your model. Right. Whether you know them or not. Right. Um, that being said, uh, sometimes the 75 just doesn't have enough reach for general purpose applications. So for general travel photography or for landscape, having that 90 and like you said, that extra compression. And that extra magnification mm -hmm. really can, can be nice. Yeah. So you have to weigh the benefits and really what are you going to use it for? I'd say if you're primarily using it for portraiture and like faces, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. 75. Yeah. If you're going to shoot the portraits looser with a 50 or a 35 and do environmentals, then I think a 90 is great for doing those detail shots, the the hands or or the you know whatever the is being worked on. If if it's a musician, you know, mm -hmm. photographing them playing notes. So I think that you just got to figure out what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. so you can go and and make a good decision between a 75 and 90. That's pretty good. You know, there's there's a lot to this topic, and I'll, I agree with David obviously because that makes perfect sense to me. Another interesting reason to choose 90 over 75 is less about the lens itself and more about the viewfinder of an M camera mm. because mm -hmm. when you pop on a 75 on a modern M, you get the 50 and 75 frame lines, mm -hmm. which are very close to each other. And some people find them distracting or I'll forget. I'm like, wait, which one am I? Whereas when you mount a 90, you get the 28 frame line. Sure. So that's way out of the way. So you get a little more of an uninterrupted view of the frame lines. There's no mistaking it in that case. Right, exactly. Yeah. You're not going to know, you're not going to be like, which one am I? Right. So that's kind of another cool advantage of using a 90 on an M camera. Yeah. I will say as well, I find that even though there's a relatively nominal difference between those two lenses focal length wise, mm -hmm. I can handhold a 75 so much easier hmm. than a 90. 
I can hit, I can shoot a 75 at a 60th if I haven't had too much coffee that day. <laughs> That's the key. Uh, right, but at 90, I often find I have to be at a 125th or faster. It's just that, that little bit of extra magnification seems to make a big mm. difference. And obviously that depends on how steady your hands are sure. and all that stuff. But for me, I can do more slow shutter speed, low light work with a 75 um, than I can with a 90, so. That's a good point as yeah. well. Yeah, I think yeah. It, does, it does depend on a lot of variables, but yeah, that's, I think we've covered that pretty thoroughly. So why don't we uh, yeah, let, let's get on to the next question. Do another sure. question. Mm -hmm. uh, since we're on that topic of 75 and 90, how does the 75 Noctilux compare to the new 90 Sumilux? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, um, why don't you head off on that? So there, there we go. We got them both here today. Um, now, if, if you, let me take the caps off here. Uh, if you were to look at these lenses next to each other, you actually would be hard pressed to tell much of a difference. Let's see if I can get them on a close-up cam here. There they are. Uh, hold on, wait, yes. <laughs> Sorry, the reflection is. So this is the 75, excuse me, the 75 uh, Noctilux 1.25, called the Noctilux because it's faster than 1.4. And this is the 90 Sumilux 1.5, called the Sumilux because it is faster than F2. So. Same basic barrel design. They're only about 50 grams apart in weight. They both have the ability to use a tripod foot, which is pretty cool. So if you want to take the weight off of your camera's mount, this is also handy if you want to try out this lens on multiple cameras and not have to keep taking the camera off your tripod because this goes on the tripod instead. Handy for testing like David and I do a lot. Now, these two lenses fall under pretty much the same sort of argument or, or discussion that David and I just had about 90 or 75. But from a sort of image quality perspective, um, I have shot these side by side. And what I can say is they follow their namesakes better than you may think. The 75 Noctilux, in terms of the bouquet and the overall rendering, feels more like a Noctilux, a 50, in this case, a 50 Noctilux. It's considerably sharper especially across the frame as opposed to just being sharp in the center. So performance wise, it is a step above or several steps above. Whereas the 90 Sumilux renders more like a Sumilux. I would say the bokeh is a little bit smoother. It's not as, mm, I don't wanna say swirly, it's not as um, defined in a way. The 75 um, bokeh is just a little bit more fun. The 90 is a little more serious, a little bit less or a little bit smoother transitions from highlights to shadows and shapes. So the 90 will also get you a slightly higher reproduction ratio. It focuses down to a meter or a little bit less. Um, if you turn it all the way, here's the 75, hold on. Ah, here's the 90. Yeah, 90 goes to about a meter and the 75 goes to 0.85 meters. So it's a little bit closer. So slightly higher reproduction ratio uh, for the 90, barely. For me, the argument between these two comes down to hand holdability and rendering. I like the way the 75 renders. They're equally sharp. They're both insanely sharp, wide open, stop down. Mm. There's no real sharpness difference between the two. I prefer the way the 75 Noctilux renders. I like the way that the focus falls off. I find it just very pleasing. It's not distracting like using a vintage lens, but it's like the best of both. And that being said, if you, were, if you needed the reach or if you had a 75, let's say Apple Summicron, I'd probably go with a 90. You wouldn't want to have too much duplication. If you had a 75 Sumacron, you probably wouldn't get a 75 Noctilux mm -hmm. right away, unless you got rid of the 75 APO. Right. So yeah, I mean, again, very similar barrel design, almost exactly the same. They both take a six, seven millimeter filter, both about 1100 grams. So they're pretty hefty, you can see. I mean, it takes up my entire hand. Um, I like them both a lot. I, I would say um, if I had the 90, mm -hmm. I'd probably have to have an SL2 to go with it because that stabilization balances extremely well. You should throw it on there. I will actually. Yeah. That stabilization is extremely, extremely nice to have uh, when you've got the 90 Lux on there. Let's pop it on. This. Here we go. So this is the 90 Sumo Lux on the SL2. We'll get a little close-up shot here. Uh, there we go. Nice. Look at that. I mean, it really balances beautifully on here. Yeah, that's nice. And of course, again, having that high-resolution viewfinder makes you know, I was playing with this this morning with the SL2, shooting wide open with the focus magnification here. It's actually quite easy. And I find it easier. Okay, so this is the easiest 90 to focus wide open. And someone would say, well, why? It has the least depth of field. Yes, but it's also the sharpest. Right. And by that very nature, the sharper a lens is, the easier it's going to be with a live view situation mm -hmm. to focus because the point where it goes from in focus to out of focus is much more obvious. It's more clearly defined. So. 
I like the 90 Sumo Lux a lot. This lens is the newest one in Leica's lineup. It came out last year. Last year, November, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, so this is still not fully baked in our minds in terms of <laughs> you know using it and getting it out in the field. I have to thank um, Rob and Chris at Leica USA for loaning this to us for this video because we, yeah. don't, we don't have this lens yet. They're a little hard to um, find. Yeah, we still yeah. have people waiting for these yep. um, where the 75 is ours. So it would be my choice to seven would be the 75 because mm -hmm. I also like that focal length. I find it very walk walk around friendly. If you like that reach, if you like that ultimate level of compression or that really smooth sumo looks bokeh, get a 90 lux. Wow, that was a long explanation, but I, no, that was great. Know. That was great. Okay. And and I would I would just add the yes. reason I think that it balances so well both of these lenses on the mm -hmm. SL2 mm -hmm. is you're looking at that 67 millimeter front diameter. Well, that's the same as the Apo Summicron SL range, mm -hmm. right? So that lens is sort of mated to the SL2 body and and is desi designed to balance beautifully. So yeah. Actually, the, the lens cap, the plastic cap for the 75 and 90s is the same one that goes on the Apple yeah, yeah, yeah. SL lenses. Yeah, so, right. this, is, this is the same one. Yeah, you know, they come this for you, so you guys know. Um, you get the metal little like hat with the felt inside, and you get a standard E67 plastic cap when you buy this. So you can choose how intense you want to be with your cap decision. So these lenses are incredible. They're pricey relative to the rest of the lineup. I, I, I know that. But when you actually use one, and you just look at the way it renders compared to any other M lens, it's mind blowing. I mean, the performance wide open of these two lenses across the frame, corner to corner, is insane. Yeah. I mean, it's insane. For sure. All right. That was a long answer. Okay. Next. That was a good answer. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> That's, uh, I think we will be ready for our next question in a second. Again, a little tripod foot, which I removed. So if you look at these lenses and have one, you go, mine doesn't look like that. So, yes, because I took off the tripod foot just so that we are um, on the same page. Handy to have, but. I don't always use it. It just depends on my tripod needs for that day. Jose, are we ready for another question? Yes. Okay. Uh, which telephoto M lens has the highest reproduction ratio? Well, I can. That's an easy one. Yeah. The. Right there. Where is it? Ah. <laughs> this one. <laughs> ah! He did drop. That something. wasn't my fault. That was rigged. <laughs> this cap is like totally worn out. That was so. rigged to fall. <laughs> that was totally not my fault. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So this lens, which is an. Apo Summicron M, 75 millimeter F2 what, ASP. What, you should elaborate on what what is reproduction ratio sure. practically first. Uh, reproduction ratio means basically how close to life size an object that you're photographing can be. And that's determined by both the focal length, which is your magnification, as well as your minimum focus distance. So the closer you can focus and the longer the focal length is, and that balance between the two gives you a reproduction ratio. So this is the highest reproduction ratio, more so than a 90 because the 75 here, this is the 75 F2 APO, can focus down to 0.7 meters. The 90 by comparison, let's say the 90 Summicron can focus, which is same, Summicron, can focus down to one meter. The 90 Sumerit, the 2.4, can focus down to 0.9 meters. So it's actually pretty close in terms of reproduction ratio, neck and neck between the 90 Sumerit and the 75 Sumicron. But the 75 Sumicron has a very slight edge in that department. Yeah. Because even though the 90 is a longer focal length, the 75 can focus just a little bit closer. So if you want the greatest magnification and Without using any kind of macro, yeah, yeah, with, with no, you know, with, yeah, yeah, no, no macro adapters, nothing. Sans accoutrement. That's right. Uh, you you'd use this lens, and which is also why it's really nice for portraiture, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. you can get really close to your subject and really get that that buttery smooth bokeh that we all love. Mm -hmm. And this lens is is also very sharp, wide open, and it it's handy. It's not much bigger than a seven than a than a fifty millimeter. Yeah, it's an E49 filter size. It's a very, very manageable lens. What does yeah. that thing weigh? Let's see, I've got it here. 430 grams, which is, you know, in the mid-range of what most of these tellies are, mm -hmm. mid-range low side, so it's very usable. Yeah. It's got a nice retractable hood. It's a modern digital era lens. Yeah, you can see this one has been, well, they can't see it. I can see it's been very well used because well, we, we use I think, it. I think your close-up's over there. We use it all the time. So um, you, you can uh, show it off. I can show it off a little bit here. There you go. Yeah, we get a little closer. There you go. This is the 75 Summicron F2. Beautiful. Apo. There's the hood out, so you can see that. Yeah, I mean, this is a sweet lens. And again, it's not 
terribly large. I'll put it next to the 90 Sumacron, which is here. There you go. So you can get a sense of... Well, you got the back cap on oh, one. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna, there we go. I gotta get a meritus comparison here. Ugh, there we go. So there's a 90 here, 75 there. So it's definitely... A little smaller. Smaller, and this is an E55, this is an E49. So smaller in all dimensions, and it weighs good bill, good less. So. And go. it and it is nice and quick to focus, mm -hmm. and uh, that's one of Leica's first telephoto lenses with floating element focusing actually as well. Fancy. So it performs equally well at minimum focus as it does at infinity. Very cool. And yeah. the other little trivia about the seventy five Apo SL. SL. Yeah, the Apo. <laughs> that's, that's eight videos ago, David. <laughs> A little bit. The Apo Sumicron M. Mm, there we go. Uh, is that it is actually based on the same optical design as the 50 millimeter Sumalux M aspheric. Both designed go. by Mr. Peter Carpa. Thanks, Peter. Appreciate it. Nice lens. All right. Next question. All right. What are the differences between the two 90 micro lenses? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I can take that one. I have them right here. So. Let me preface this by saying we are going to do a macro dedicated uh, live stream at some point because that seems to be a topic of interest. So I'm not going to get into like the techniques and stuff. But Leica produces um, two versions of the 90 macro, and they just discontinued the what I call version one, which is um, this one right here. I'm going to go close up. Now it's going to be hard to tell on on the close up how these look. So we've got the version two here, version one. If I go like this, you can see maybe that the version two has a much wider aperture ring that protrudes out from the front, where the version one does not, which makes it much easier to change your aperture. This also has a very, very nice smooth focus ring, much smoother than the version one. And the version one, because it was designed to be mounted either upright or upside down using the older macro adapter that was rangefinder coupled, it has a lot more play in the um, collapsible section of the barrel because you can rotate it either way to lock it depending on where you want the aperture scale to show on top or bottom. If you're not using that specific adapter, it's really a pain to get it aligned right and it's like you're constantly like lining it up and turning it. Whereas the version two, it just goes one way. You turn it out, or you pull it out, you turn it, and then it's locked. Like that's it, there's no fiddling. So it's a lot less fiddly. Uh, optically, they are the same from what I understand. Sometimes I'll, I'll think that I can see a difference, but I think I'm just illusional. Um, let me take off the caps here and retract these in. So you can sort of see we got the version one. It's also a little shorter. There's the version one, version two. So ergonomic improvements, barrel con improvements, construction improvements. And of course, you could never buy the 90 macro version one by itself. It always came as a kit, unless you got it in silver chrome, which is a pretty rare piece. Uh, here we go. This is the 90 macro version one in silver, silver chrome, meaning it's a brass barrel. And I'm gonna take the cap off here. So this of course has all the same design features or lack thereof as the version one, except they don't make a version two in silver. They made limited um, production of the silver one for the version one and it came by itself. It didn't come with the adapter and all the other stuff. So I happen to be a bit of a geek for unusual silver chrome lenses. This is definitely one of them. Um, so this is a kind of a cool exception to my rule of normally not going with the version one, unless, of course, I'm shooting film or on an M9, which doesn't have live view. There, I think that's it. We'll go more into this when we do our macro video, but that's basically yeah. a pretty thorough. That was a good breakdown. I, I think so. I mean, I mean, of course very specific, you would. but you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What's, what do we got next? Let's for go. the for the five people that want to know that. Well, you're welcome, five people. There you go. There we go. Put this down. Why, what would I use the 135 Apple Tedded for? Well, I can tell you what I would use it for. It may not be what you would use it for. <laughs> uh, you asked what you would, right? So Yeah, you, well, you mean me, right? Yes, David Vargas. Yeah. Uh, the 135 is an awesome lens. Right, yeah. Right I mean... That weird back cap on it. It doesn't have a weird back cap on it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I didn't have another lens. There okay. Yeah, so this is a... A really high performing lens, the 135 3.4 Apo Telet. And uh, what would I use it for? Well, oh, that's interesting. Doo -doo -doo. 
Are we having some technical? Challenges? We're having a little bit of uh, YouTube internet yeah, thing. We're, so we're apologizing if we're apologize if this connection is a little choppy. Apparently, YouTube is experiencing some technical difficulties. Is this our fault or their fault? Usually, it's their fault. <laughs> so I guess I don't have to feel too bad. Um, it's complicated. What I'll say is, um, if we end up with a, a live stream that's a bit choppy, we'll probably re-upload it, uh, like we did for the S, just so that. We, ha we do have accessible, high quality. We do. Um, yeah, sometimes we're just at the mercy of the platform. I Too many people streaming. It's free for everyone, so I guess that's the... You get what you pay for. I mean, are we still on? Like, we can yeah, we're just poor connection right now. So again, apologies if this yeah. is super choppy. Yeah, Julie, if you're watching, tell me how this looks. <laughs> All we'll right. Keep, we'll keep going. We'll keep going. We'll power through. We'll power through. Okay. There it is. There it is. All right, so that is the 135. At Potel at M. It's, you know, pretty light. Uh, even though it, it looks larger. How much do we have on this one? Weight wise, yeah. we are at 450 grams. Okay, now I'm gonna compare it. These are both E49, right? That's right. Yep. So this is the the 75 that I just spoke spoke about. And this is the 135, just so you see a kind of a relative size comparison. So it's the same barrel diameter, just a little bit longer. Now the question was, what would I use it for? And I will actually answer that. So what I use it for is landscape photography. Well, what do you mean landscape photography? You don't you use wide angle lenses? <laughs> That's right. Yes, but uh, telephoto is really nice for, again, what Josh mentioned at the start of this, compression. I find the, the telephoto lenses, starting at around 90 and getting a little better at 135, is if you're shooting let's say mountains, what's really nice is being able to get all those mountains at different distances to stack and it almost becomes a, a single unified design uh, in terms of, you know, imagine like this, the Smoky Mountains or the Grand Canyon. So these are really good for, um, for distant landscape applications. I don't use the 135 much for, for close-up work. I would say mainly I'm just using it for things that are far away. So either landscape or urban landscape, cityscape, things like that. What, what about you, Josh? I mean, for me, I think detail shots are, are really nice with the 135. It's got razor thin depth of field mm. wide open. As you get at or near minimum distance, oof, you gotta be on it. I would say I'm on a tripod or I'm focus bracketing or I'm using a EVF or VisaFlex or something or I'm on an SL2. But I love the way it renders wide open. It's really an easy lens to hold. It's not terribly heavy, as you said. It's been balanced as well. It's just kind of long, but it's not unwieldy, mm -hmm. at least in my experience. No, uh, no. And so I think it's a bit of an underrated lens, but very much so. It's one a sleeper. that you know, one that we like. So yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully our audio is still good if our video is breaking. Chop, up. chop. That's fine. It's just we're at the mercy of the platform, as I said. Oh well, that's okay. Um, this is throwing us off. I'm throwing off our rhythm now. Now let's let's keep going. The people want questions, and we have answers. Jose. All right. Um, can you talk about the 90 millimeter thumb bar? Sure, I, we can do that. Um, so, like a reissued, uh, they started with the 28 Sumeron, basically a reissue of an older design, and they continued that theme with the 90 thumb bar 2.2, which unfortunately I tried to get for this video. Thank you, Albert. But alas, it, it could not get here in time. No one's fault, but I happens. think we got one right here. Yeah, right. Yeah, you can't see I, it though. But I've shot with it enough to know, you know, yeah. what it renders like. So, if you want the ultimate vintage look in a modern barrel, six-bit coated, modern lens coatings, modern construction, with a warranty, fan bar, because it's really, really hard to get that rendering or to get that look in post-production. You'll be agonizing over it, and it's a brass barrel lens. It's black paint. It comes mm -hmm. with a really cool silver chrome uh, brass rear cap, which is kind of fun. And you have this cool center filter that can really, um, you know, make it even more magical and wild. On Red Dart Forum, when we, uh, when Leica launched the fan bar, we do have a bunch of sample images as well. If you want to see, yeah. um, maybe we can probably pull it up. I am gonna uh, pull it up well. right now. So the fan bar is a lens that- Give me a second. You wouldn't use it every day. A lot like the Noctilux or any of these other really exotic, interesting or specific lenses. But it's a lens that you'll have a lot of fun with. I've seen people do portraits with it, and you get this almost like um, Hollywood 50s era glamorous. Actually, we have a YouTube video on do it. We? We on do we? On our YouTube channel that we are on right now? Okay. We, we but do don't watch fact. it now because no. you're watching us. But, um, but I can show you. So there it is. 
Uh, hey, there it we is. have a, a look at the Than bar. So Six that's actually the, the lens right there. And I'm pretty sure I have this muted, but I can uh, try to do, 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 do. Well, that is me. Hey, you look so young. I do. Oh, was that it six, wasn't that. It six was months ago. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what, uh, what was that? Anyway, is it cool? But do we have any sample shots in this post here? Uh, I'm looking through. Probably not here. But I think the launch post we do. We should have had this pulled up. Oh, it's six-bit coded. See, there we go. Yep. Yeah, I'll. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the fan bar, uh, it's, a, it's a detentless aperture. It is a fascinating lens. If you've never tried one, there we go. If Here's you've never tried it. one and you have the opportunity to get your hands on one, just play with it. Oh, yeah, look, look, look at that. Look at that. That's wild. It's not for everyone. It's it's almost like a paint, like it's an impressionist not, painting. It's not for every day, but wow, it is something else. It is something else when you nail a shot. Go to that, yeah, that one right there. All this swirliness, look at that. I love that. Again, it's just something different. And that's out of camera. There's no like filter. Or, that is the filter. Or there's no like post-production yeah. filter. No, 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 no. That stuff. That's just the character um, of the lens. It is It is something very unique. So yeah, that, here is, is a, yeah. that is the fan bar. It really, it, it transcends a, a photograph and almost becomes yeah. a painting. Yeah. And you say, oh, but it's Photoshop. It's like, no, this is not Photoshop. Camera. This Everybody is out always of camera. gives us a hard time. Like, I want it to be out of camera. I want it to be perfect. Well, here's your chance to look, right, right. To look very unique out of camera. And very much so. Basically, much no so. post processing. So. Yeah. That's it's a good it's wild. A unique lens and a good question. And check out the video if you guys um, have a chance. So I think uh, we're almost ready for another question. Hopefully, our stream is carrying uh, along. Yeah, poorly. poor, poor, poor. Oh, oh wait. And excellent. It's just bouncing around. It's bouncing. Yeah, sorry, everybody. Sorry, guys. Again, not our fault. Totally absolved of all responsibility. Um, how are we doing, Jose? All right, let's go to the next one. All right. What do we got? All right. What telephoto M lens will give you the best performance on the M10 monochrome? Hmm. So what they're really asking is, what are the best telephoto M lenses performance-wise? Um, David, are you troubleshooting? I'm going to take this one. I'm trying to troubleshoot. Okay, that's go, fine. Go for it. David is being the IT guy right now. I appreciate that. So, okay, what we're really asking here is what lens is the sharpest of all the telephoto lenses? So here is, in my opinion, in order. I would say the 75 Noctilux and 90 Sumalux are basically the same, followed by, well, I would say the 90 Macro. Yes, the Macro Elmar M 90 millimeter F4 is insanely sharp. We're, we're only talking about sharpness here. We're not talking about bokeh or blah, blah, blah. Then I would say the 90 Apo, but maybe stop down one or two stops because that lens is really two lenses. It's like a magical, beautiful, soft, not soft, um, dreamy portrait lens and you stop it down and it's like razor sharp. Um, 75 Summicron is going to be right up there as well, the one uh, David just showed. Mm -hmm. And everything else kind of falls underneath uh, that. But I do think that the 75 and 90 uh, 75 Noctilux, 90 Sumalux, wide open, insane. Stop down, insaner. But <laughs> I'm telling you. I don't think that's a word, Josh. Uh, more insane. The 90 Macro, the version 2 especially, corner to corner sharpness. Yeah. Wide open at F4. I know it's only F4, but whatever. On an M10 monochrome or an SL2, I, I shot with it this morning. I was shocked. It's got resolution that, for days. Really? How yeah. good that lens yeah. is. Sure, it's not a lens you'd use for certain things. It doesn't have a lot of magical whatever, but if you just want something really, really sharp, and you don't want to buy a 90 Zoom Lux, um, buy a 90 Macro. I mean, it, people think it's called a Macro, it has to be only for Macro. Like, no, no, it actually is a, a good lens, an amazing lens. Um, yeah, uh, 90 Apo again after, comes after that, only because to get the 90 Apo to be as sharp corner to corner as the Macro, you do have to stop it down to about F4. Um, at F2, it is incredible, it's beautiful, it's sharp in the center, but it does fall off quite a bit, which is part of its design, it's part of its rendering, it's not, a, I have no problem with that. Um, but it definitely is not as outright sharp or high performing on an M10 monochrome as the uh, Macro Elmar is. Um, and also, I don't want to discount the Sumerit, which of course they don't make anymore. Uh, the 90 Sumer 2.4, which is a stellar performer on the monochrome. I like it a lot. And it's small and it's light yeah. and pre owned. They're not that expensive relatively. No. So, that w I mean, that's usually when someone says, okay, I want a telephoto lens, but I'm not using a lot. I just want something that's really capable that, you know, I I don't necessarily want to go for a Cron or Noctilux mm -hmm. or Sumalux. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what can I get that's going to be a good 90? It's not going to be too big, yeah. but it's going to be good. And yeah. I'm like, 90 Sumerit. Yeah, and what's interesting too is the 2.4 version of the Sumerits um, come in uh, black or silver. So if you've got a silver M10 or a silver M240, I think these are both 90s. Yes. So these are um, the 90 Sumerit in black and the 90 Sumerit in silver. So that's another cool, yeah. you know, to get a 90 Sumercon in silver, 
you've got a hunt on the used market and they're super rare and they're brass, they're heavy. Um, I showed the 90 macro and silver, but that is the version one. They don't make a version two 90 macro and silver yet. If anyone that like it is listening, make one for me. Um, so anyway, that's another cool uh, reason to get the 90. So sweet. Um, how are we doing over there, Jose? Are we ready for another question? I'm ready. David, are you ready to answer one? I am. I'm doing all the work I here. I am. You're not doing. You're just. You're just playing solitaire over there. I don't know. Uh, Minesweeper. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Minesweeper. All right. What do we got? Hopefully, we made a little bit of a change. A little bit of a change. So hopefully, yeah. the the streaming quality improved a little bit. Yeah. Um, so but keep us posted, you know, in the comments, like we, we want to know what's going on. You yeah. Know, listen, if anybody's like, we can't order sir. Let, let, let's see. I'm, I'm actually curious okay, right now. Let's take a look. This is a little bit unusual for us. We don't like to break the rhythm, but I also do want to know, um, how things are looking. Uh, okay. People say people it looks say all right. right. Let's, yeah. not, let's not get distracted. Let's keep going. Jose, what do you got? All right. Uh, let me see. Let me see. What, uh, what did Leica change between the 75 and 90 2.5 and 2.4 lenses? Uh, a few things. So, I mean, mainly they are, well, they're mechanical and some small optical changes, but the biggest difference is we went from 2.5 aperture to 2.4. And um, they're, I mean, a little weird quirk is there's different writing on them, but the different font, if that matters. Yeah. Uh, that's a little super weird esoteric trivia is that the yeah. the 2.5 Simurates actually have a different font than every other Leica lens. Hmm. Okay, you cool. probably don't care about that. <laughs> I, care. I, I care, dude, I care, okay. keep going. But um, the minimum focus, I, I think most noticeably, because really there's not a huge difference between 2.5 and 2.4, you're talking about a 10th of a stop, which mm. most people can't even see that. Yeah. But look, more is better, right? I'll take it. More take is better. It. I'll take it. The biggest difference was the reduction in minimum focus distance. I mentioned earlier at the start when we were talking about reproduction ratio uh, about the, the 90 Sumerit being 0.9 meters. Well, the first one, the 2.5 version, was not. It was one meter. So they increased, or I should say decreased the minimum focus distance from one meter to 0.9 meters. That, and that may not sound like a lot, but it's a lot bigger difference than f2.5 to f2.4. Yeah because that really allows you to get in a lot, a, a fair amount closer. Yeah. Um, and then the, the 75 was reduced from... 0.9 to 0.7? Yeah, 0.9 to 0.7, 0 .7, which, isn't, yeah. even, which yeah. is even more, more dramatic. Yeah. Uh, so that was really nice. And yeah. so that way, the, the 75 uh, Sumerit actually is almost the same as the... Kicking my dog. <laughs> so as, as the 75 Apple <laughs> Sumicron. Oh, wow. So uh, those are some changes. Also, the, the aperture itself changed? I think we, we changed the, the blade style or not? Uh, no, I think that's, that you think of the 35 version two, I think. Right, not, yeah. okay, in the 75 and 90. I mean, barrel control, like I have, like right now I've got, you know, we've got a 75 uh, Sumerit in silver, and a 75, a uh, 2.4, and a 75, 2.5 Sumerit mm -hmm. in black. Thank you, Kirsten, for letting me borrow your lens. So, nice little close -up. if we get a little close-up action, I will try to hold these in a manner that you can see them. Ooh, uh, nice. The silver one is quite shiny here. So, very similar. This one, the um, a little bit ergonomically more friendly, just slightly, slightly thicker and more um, protruding aperture ring on the uh, 2.4. So you've got 20 grams lighter, 2, 0.2 meters closer focusing. Of course, this now comes in silver or black, whereas the 2.5 was only available in uh, black. The, you can see that they had a bit of a fading going on, which was an issue with some of the Sumer 2.5s, not an issue on the uh, 2.4s, thankfully. Um, they also, when you bought a Sumer 2.5, you didn't get a leather case or a hood. You had to buy those separately. 2.4 Sumerits come with a leather case and come with a hood. It's like $200 of extra value, so, you know, that's not nothing. Um, the 2.5 Sumerits, though, are great value now in 2020 because they, there are, it's a weird lens that existed for a short period of time. They made a lot of them, and they were quickly replaced, but they're still out there. So really, value-wise, the two fives are probably the best value dollar for performance in M lenses right now. I mean, performance is quite good, but yeah. I don't know if I'd be willing to give up that extra, you know, work, that closer working distance. That's true. I think it depends on what you find. And, you know, everyone's budget is going to be different. Some people, you know, if you're looking to get into a lens for a thousand bucks, but get a modern lens, mm -hmm. you know, you can do that with a 2.5 Sumerit. Um, That's true. That's I mean, true. You really can, which is, I mean, and, and nothing, I think probably, I'm, I'm sure there's some question 
<laughs> down here that's going to be asked. But I would say, let's kind of pre-guess this question. OK, well, what about a more vintage 90? Mm. A 90 Tele Elmerit, for instance, you know, versus, sure. versus a 90 Simmerit. If I can go, mm. get them both mm. used for $950. Right, 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 right. Well, you know, I think I know what I would go with. Right. I mean, a lot of that depends on what camera you're using. And also, the reality is a 90 Elmerit, Tele Elmerit, they're good lenses, but it's hard to beat a modern lens in terms of sharpness and performance, corner to corner and um, nice even fall off on a digital camera if, mm -hmm. we're all, if we're talking about maximum performance. You know, I joked about this with you earlier today because what I, what I always do before these live streams is as I get up, I get the tripod out and I just put every single one of these lenses against each other because I want to have a fresh take on how these all compare. And you, you, this, it starts off, okay, all I'm thinking about is image quality. But mm -hmm. what you realize is you actually, you noticed very quickly the usability differences oh, yeah, between sure. even lenses that are you know ten or twenty years apart. Mm -hmm. How Leica improved the aperture rings, the, fo the feel of the focus, the throw of the focus, the way the lens mounts on the camera, the readability of the aperture and focusing scale—all those things dramatically changed. So, mm -hmm. usability-wise, you know the ergonomics and the mechanics—they've come so far, but it's hard to to realize that until you actually use you know four generations of a ninety at the same time. Yeah. Right after one after the other, and you're like, wow. <laughs> Doesn't everybody do that? No, I don't think anybody <laughs> does. Um, so I do enjoy using the vintage or pre current 90 2.8 lenses. They render in a fun way and they're great values and they're small. Um, I'll ask you a question, David, because yeah. I already answered this. So you've got a favorite 90. I do. Why don't you tell us about it? I'll hand it to you because I already know the answer. <laughs> uh, this, this is my lens. Mm -hmm. This is a. Uh, one of the what do I categorize this? The one of my uh, pry it from my cold dead hands yes. lenses. Yes, 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 yes. Now, what is it? It is. I'm waiting for my close up here. Oh, there we go. Ooh, pretty. I mean, mine's a little knocked around, as you can see. Well, because you use it. That's what I do made, use what it. What it's made for. And I've I've had this particular lens for I'm trying to think. I don't know, 15 years maybe. Wow. So it's held up pretty yeah, well. They consider made this from uh, just for reference from yeah. 1990 to 2007. I would say 2006. Well, yeah, I, lingering around. Yeah, so this is a this is a ninety Elmerit, uh, and it's just an amazing lens, ninety Elmerit M, not not Apo, not a Spheric, not anything. And uh, Elmerit means it's a it's a two point eight maximum aperture, and it has a minimum focus distance of one meter, and it's just a really nice lens, image quality wise. I, I've shot with. The 90 Summicron. I had a 90 Summicron, Apo Summicron. Um, I have this. I've used the 90 Simmerit. And actually, the reason that this was discontinued in 2006 is that the, the Simmerit range came out when the M8 was introduced. Mm -hmm. So this, I think at the time, was a 1999 lens, so $2,000 lens. And it came up against Simmerit, which was $1,600. And Leica quickly realized the lens was half a stop faster and five hundred dollars cheaper, and lighter as well, and lighter with quicker focusing turn yeah. and all that. Yeah. So, so the Elmerit was uh, was phased out, but I held on to mine, and I've never regretted that. It's it's just a beautiful lens. It handles great. It's obviously held up remarkably well over yeah. the years of of many use. I actually have two of these. I have one in silver as well. Yeah, silver chrome. Silver chrome. Brass barrel. Yep. Super rare. Yep. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Amazing. I should have probably grabbed that before the live stream. <laughs> no, you don't. It, it's sitting it's, like it's 15 hiding. feet it's that way. Away. That's okay. It's not hiding. Can, I know we can exactly. talk about it. it. So, yeah, I have, I have two. I don't use the silver chrome version much because it is very heavy. Mm, yeah. It's noticeably heavier. But I, I love this lens. It's, it's nice and sharp where it counts and just has amazing, you know, smooth, buttery bokeh. I don't feel, and I never felt that I was giving up too much versus an F2 lens. If I didn't have this lens and I, you know, don't have two of them, I would definitely go with a 90 Sumerit mm. because it's that same philosophy. And I like that this is not so big. You know, it's 46 millimeter front diameter, which is the same as a 35 Lux, which I also have. So I'm able to share filters between the, the 35 and the 90 if I, if I do use filters. Uh, yeah, not much to say. It's just a great lens. Yeah, the 90 Elmerit is an interesting lens because it's built like a more modern lens with a retractable metal shade and 
It's ergonomically much like a lens you would buy new, although the shade is a little finicky on David's, but that's because he beats the crap out of it. Um, well, it's non-locking. Yes, yeah, it doesn't lock. But but it, I'm testing it today. It does render very nicely. The corners are not as sharp as a modern lens, so it's not for landscape wide open. But it really is a nice balance of modern construction, but a I don't want to say a vintage, but maybe a retro rendering mm. with still very sharp in the center. Yeah. Um, chromatic aberration, very well controlled. Mm -hmm. It actually, yeah, it's it's been underrated for a long time, but they're starting to creep up in value they now are. because people are realizing that it's a good value. It is quite dense. I mean, we're oh, talking yeah. about eh, oh, we're talking about four hundred and ten grams for that versus how much for the silver? Three. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to know. Three hundred and forty-six <laughs> grams for right. So that's a fifteen percent. It's noticeable. Um, and whatever, I can't do math. Ten or fifty percent weight yeah. difference, but yeah. you know, we're talking about small lenses, so you do feel it, but yeah. it's a nice lens. Well, I'll say this. Yeah. I, I tend to use it in, in one of two modes. So if I'm doing, and, and you talk about corner performance, and mm -hmm. here, we, I know we're all after that last, you know, nth percent of mm -hmm. performance. Certainly, I am. I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm as guilty of anybody. That's <laughs> all I do. Yeah. So why am I willing to sacrifice on this lens? So the reason is, and you you made a very specific statement, wide open corner performance. Mm -hmm. So here's the deal. When I'm shooting, let's say, a subject. Again, I talked about, I, I really like photographing hands because I think it tells a lot about a person, a, a, if they're a musician or an artist uh, or a performer or, or just anybody, it really tells a lot of emotion. That's all centered. Um, I don't want the periphery in focus. And in fact, mm -hmm. I'm going to shoot that wide open to get that really nice texture, central focus, and I want everything to fall away. Then you mentioned landscape and being sharp to the corners. Well, generally, if I'm shooting this for landscape, which I do, I'm going to be shooting it at F8. And it's remarkably sharp, mm -hmm. corner to corner, edge to edge, very little distortion, no fall off. And I get the best of both worlds. I get that yeah. kind of central, yeah. like you say, more vintage yeah. central isolation with modern sharpness at, at the center point. Yeah. And then when I stop it down, I get modern performance or near about. Yeah. No, I agree. I think it's um, you like that lens more than I do, but uh, hey, listen, fine. we gotta have our yeah, favorites, of right? course, of course. I, I do think it is a, it, it exists in a unique space in the world of Leica. So. Mm -hmm. All right, for sure. I think we do. We have any before we bother Jose some more. We've had probably a billion zillion questions in the comments. Yeah, I'm just going to uh, take a look here. I, I, we, we, in the first like eight or nine videos, we kind of, we, I didn't, we didn't really troll and, and or, or you know sift through these as much. As oh, that's funny. Life. Look, look, and actually, I predicted it. You know, soon we're down two four yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Sumer at sumer at ninety two point four is lighter. Yep. Sharper in the corners, wide open, has less vignetting, slightly less barrel distortion, although it's pretty nominal. Mm -hmm. It's a modern lens, meaning you get a modern metal threaded hood. Modern focus feel, modern aperture stop down with a warranty. It's just it is a better built lens overall, but some you know if you wanted more of a um, classic classic rendering, meaning your bokeh is a little bit swirlier, a little bit you've got a little more chromatic aberration, a little bit, uh, a little more <laughs> vignetting. Go with the Almeret. Again, we're only what we're really talking about here is wide open performance. Yeah. At f8, yeah, yeah, yeah. like six out of eight nineties are going to look exactly the same, or like close enough where you're splitting hairs at that point. But we don't. David and I don't spend our days shooting an F8 when we're shooting lenses that we know render a certain way wide open. We're shooting wide open because that's uh, what we yeah, want. Yeah, I'll, I'll give an example. You have anything cool over there? Yeah, I'm okay. just going to give an example here. Sweet. So, Oh, no, that's a good one. Yeah. Can we pull up the old Computron? The, comp the Computron? There Let me move is. that out of the way. You know, so that is shot wide open on the 90. Which camera? Uh, that That's an M10. Okay. Yep, so this is M10 with the 90 Elmerit. Shot wide open, and you can see it's, you know. Now, okay, so now look at that. Like, I'm pointing like they can see me. <laughs> you go to the center. Look at that. Um, now go to the corner of where the little, uh, yeah, keep going, where the lights are. So you see how there's they're slightly elongated, and you can, you can actually see the shape of the aperture blades. That is one of the telltale signs of a lens that's one or two generations old. Mm -hmm. Because as, like, his barrel or, or lens design has gotten better, those would become more sort of perfectly circular. Yeah. Um, they would have a smoother fall off, which I'm not saying is good or bad, it's different. Uh, but that there is a hallmark of, of the rendering of um, one or two generations prior. But center is beautiful. Zoom out again? Yeah. Yeah, and then the and overall. You can start to see a little bit of vignetting in the corners there. 
uh, especially in the bottom left. But again, yeah, that I helps isolate right the subject. Yep, I mean, that's right part there. of the lens's character. So nice shot. Yeah. Nice so cool. that's and then the same person. We're talking about hands, right? Yeah. Well, here we go. I like that one. Okay. And there you go. So that is kind of what I'm using the 94. This was some you know photojournalism type stuff. So. I was trying to capture her emotion because she just actually lost a competition, mm -hmm. a sheep shearing competition. Oh, as one does. I mean, that's a big thing. But you can see, you know, the the remnants of the uh, the wool on her shirt, and you could see that kind of tightened, you know, uh, mood and that thought thoughtfulness on her face. Yeah. So, cool. uh, so that's kind of a, a neat thing, and then it's also good for, let's say, you know, where you want compression. <laughs> I don't want compression there. <laughs> no, but but something like that, you know, where this is not something you could necessarily shoot with a wider lens. Right. Well, you, would, yeah. you probably wouldn't want to. You wouldn't to want to. You want to get that close. Yeah, right up, right oh, up someone's bottom. All right, let's... Um, you get the idea. Yeah, let's keep, let's keep moving, though. I want to make sure we get to all the questions. Anything else good in the... Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, someone says... And this is a good one. Here. I think it's on our... Someone else has it. Well, that. actually, I'm going to... I, here's another question that uh, I I was thinking about before we started this, okay. right? Go. So David, no relation, <laughs> uh, and says, David, have you used the 75 or 90 on your CL? Ooh, yeah. And what do you think? I think a lot of things. Uh, yes, I have used my 90 on my CL, which makes it a 135, which is really good for long telephoto landscape like you'd use the 135 for. Mm. But as much as I love 90 on full frame, it's a little bit long on my CL. And actually, I really love the 75 F2 APO on the CL. Pop it on there so they can see what it looks like. Because yeah. that gives you an equivalent of a 100 millimeter F2, which is awesome. Uh, it, it's like a 90, but better. There so I'll show you that. Wait. Wait for it. <laughs> this is... Um, you the, also find the 90 on the CL, you got to be pretty steady or in good light because you're not stabilized. So you right. do it. Where the 75, like, you know, as 100, you know, I can get away with it. But it, it balances really nicely. Yeah, that's nice. It's not super front heavy with the 75, right? It's, I don't find it just tipping forward like it would with a, a heavier lens. For mm -hmm. instance, the 75 F2 SL lens works really nicely in here too to give you the same exact thing, except it really right. yanks it forward because the lens is about twice as heavy. you got to have the grip and the thumbs up. Right. Or this, you can get away without either of those. Two you can things. get away with just a, a symbol, yeah. simple setup yeah. where I'm just going to take a, a, my CL lens off, throw an M lens on, and uh, it even will you know, sit, sit flat on the table instead yeah. of wobbling. Yeah, so it's, it's really nice. Uh, the 90 as well, it's, it clearly will mount on there. And it has about the same handling because it's the same filter diameter and same lens barrel. There we go. Look at that. Nice. So I if you're looking like for, for more reach, and for instance, when I when I first tested out Leica's first interchangeable lens APS camera, which was the, the T Type 701, I actually did use the 90 quite a bit on there. I had it in the Arizona desert uh, down in in uh, Sedona, and it was great for you know shooting birds and cactuses and stuff like that. Cacti. Cacti, yep, <laughs> on um, on the APS sensor. So so I did use it for the longer reach, specifically for, let's say, wildlife, if you want to count birds as wildlife, mm -hmm. and uh, and distant objects like saguaro cacti. Right, because the longest prime you can get for the CL native is a 60. Yeah, which is a so 90. Yeah. If you want longer lenses without going with a zoom, you're either going SL lenses, which are pretty large, or you're going with an M, one of these M primes, which are pretty compact if you go with a Elmroyd or a, a 75 Apo. So it's a good question. Yeah. Um, OK, Let's so see. now here's a good question for you. OK, talk to me. Which is? From George. Yeah, George says, how often is rangefinder calibration an issue with telephoto lenses? Mm. I've got rangefinder and lenses all dialed in, and then we'll test a 90 that doesn't focus correctly. Mm. Well, the longer you go in focal length, the less depth of field you have, which means, especially on digital, the more likely you are to notice a lens that's even ever so slightly out of calibration. Mm -hmm. A modern M lens, 90 Apo, 90 Sumerit, 90 Sumalux, can be very readily calibrated to a known state without having the camera there and will work fine. Anything older than that, you may need to have the lens calibrated to the camera because they just don't have the same level of tolerance. They don't hold the calibration as well. Honestly, 
that's a little bit of a pain. I, my recommendation is if you're using a digital M with your 90, say, and you say, I've got everything else dialed in, everything else is working great, mm. don't sacrifice that calibration for all your other lenses. Use a viewfinder or use a, um, a VisaFlex yeah. or LiveView or something similar to that so that you're not dependent on the rangefinder calibration. Right. Or learn the lens's behavior. What I mean is if you know that it's always slightly back focusing, just slightly front focus it when you're shooting it. It could also be because the depth, uh, the depth of field is so razor thin, as mm -hmm. Josh mentioned, mm -hmm. um, there's also kind of a technique, right? And I, I think a lot of us, unfortunately, we're not tripods, we're bipods, right? Yeah. We have two legs, yes. which means we wobble. I, I've seen a lot of photographers, and, and I catch myself doing it too, if you're just standing kind of flat-footed, straight up, and you're going like this, what happens is, and I'm going to kind of turn to the side so you can see, I'm getting really intent on focusing, and I'm doing this. Right. Mm. So what's happening is I'm I'm moving back and forth imperceptibly. Right. It's, He's it's exaggerating the motion. I'm exaggerating, right? <laughs> yes, it yes. might just be it might just be this much, yeah. and that's enough when you take the shot from when you focused to be out of calibration. It might actually be perfectly in calibration. Yeah. I would encourage you to put it on a tripod or at least a stack of books. I just make it a mobile. Focus with the rangefinder. And then turn on live view on your M10, M240, whatever it is, and double check to see if if the shot is actually in focus or not. Yeah. Um, or focus using live view, is it alternatively focus using live view where magnified. Then look through the rangefinder and make sure that your subject's actually aligned. If it really is offset, then yeah, your calibration's off. Yeah. But I've seen a lot of M photographers tricked into thinking that their focus calibration was off because they were actually moving a little bit yeah. and and your wider lenses are going to completely cover up that. Right. But the tele lenses, wide open, you got no forgiveness. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm doing this test today and I've got a top of the line tripod, ball head, I'm using live view, shooting a static subject. Even with all that working in my favor, I'm still struggling sometimes to get mm. minimum focus wide open, tack sharp because your threshold is so, so, so tight, especially yeah. with anything that's pre-current, like even one generation old. So if I had a wide angle lens at 35, mm. I, I'd have so much more margin of error. And we're talking more leeway. millimeters here, but millimeters make a difference. Half so a millimeter. It comes down to knowing your lens, knowing its tendencies, and getting really familiar with what does it look like when it's on and what does it look like when it's off. So yep. you know, okay, now I see I have to dial a little bit. Now I've got it. So just take practice. Um, your hit rate at first is probably going to be like 30%. Like if you get it, if you buy 90 Apo and you put it on your M10 and you're using the rangefinder, you're probably going to be, you're, in the beginning, you may be 30 or 40% or less. And you're going to go, uh, oh my goodness, this lens is trash. Um, I, I, I'm going to agree with that because yeah. when I was using a 90 Apo, I had an M8. Oh, jeez, you poor man. <laughs> and that was... Uh, so, it was a match made in not heaven. <laughs> as you learn the lens, as you learn to, to use it, as you learn to see and know what sharp looks like in both the rangefinder and in live view, your hit rate should go 60, 70, 80%. I don't mm. know if it'll ever be 100%. That's pretty hard. Mm -hmm. um, wide open. I'm talking wide open at or near minimum. The farther out you focus, the more depth of field you inherently have, the easier it is to, to nail it. So we're talking like ultimate, you know, whatever. And um, you just play around. Put it on a tripod, like David said, mm -hmm. and, you know, shoot. A bookshelf, shoot something that's that's flat where you can clearly see if it's in or out of focus and just get a feel for how that lens uh, renders. Yeah, and, and to counteract that kind of normal movement because we're humans and we, we do that yeah. without thinking, uh, I always tell photographers if you want to get sharper pictures, think of photography as a sport mm -hmm. where you need to maintain an athletic stance. You know, this seems totally unrelated to tele lenses, but if you want to improve your technique, you know, keep your knees slightly bent, lean slightly forward, and, you know, put one foot slightly in front of the other. And what that's going to do, just like you were ready to, you know, hit a golf ball, hit tennis, you know, a tennis ball, re re returning a serve. What that's going to do, putting you in that ready position when you're shooting and leaning into it, it's very hard to, to actually wobble forward and back. So your body would actually have to work aggressively to wobble rather than when you're standing straight up you have this, you know, propensity to just kind of go. Yeah. But if you can lower your center of gravity, 
lean into it to take that kind of aggressive posture. And you'll see, listen, you'll see a lot of photojournalists shooting that way and sports photographers, they, they really are in it, right? They're engaged. So if you're engaged and athletic, I, I think also that'll really contribute to getting that hit rate a lot higher on some of these lenses that have a lot tighter tolerances. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to, uh, what Anthony's talking about right there, Oh yeah, I want to talk about that right now. Okay, so, <laughs> so uh, it's, kind of interesting. it's not really a question, but we can. Yeah, still... yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, yeah. Anthony says, "Any Sumalux M75 talk?" And the answer Thank is you. not yet, but shortly when shortly. I can get my hands on it. So I have to be uh, first grateful to David, who's watching this, and uh, not this David, um, for loading me your 75 Sumalux um, for this video of my testing. I appreciate it. Now. 75 Sumalux 1.4 is a lens that I think is both misunderstood and overly glorified sometimes. Um, this is an interesting lens. Now, they made this for quite a while, up until relatively recently. You could get one of these in a silver box and it's six-bit coated and a modern. And this lens has developed a cult following because, and I, and I think this is because there are not a lot of telephoto lenses that give you a real bokeh, like a vintage, super shallow depth of field, vignetting, magic. When you think about it, I mean, this is the first 75 they ever made. So mm -hmm. everything since then is what I would consider a modern 75. 90s from this period were maybe F4, F2.8, uh, maybe a prehispheric F2, which wasn't really much. So being a 75 millimeter and also being a 1.4 means you get an incredibly shallow depth of field. Mm -hmm. Your, your focus is moderately sharp in the center at 1.4 and then very quickly falls off. It's really, really, really unique. Mm -hmm. There's no other lens that has this combination of rendering, um, compression, everything. Everything comes together to make something really interesting. Um, I, I don't think this is an everyday lens. It's not as um, extreme as the fan bar is, but it's a similar it's mindset. There. It's getting there, yeah. These have become fantastic investments and fantastic collector pieces, especially the German-made ones, like this one is, a very late production uh, German-produced. Uh, Do you want to elaborate on that? Cause... Yeah, so they made most of these in Canada, and they're exactly the same optically, supposedly, as the German-made ones. But because the ones that were made in Germany were the later production ones, they just, and they're, there's that stigma of being made in Germany. Right. They do tend to have, or they do have a higher value on the resale market than the Canadian equivalent, even though optically they're the same. And in, um, and in fact, they were designed in Canada. Yes, by Mandler. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these are these are Walter Mandler design. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if I would personally spend the money to get a seventy-five Sumalux right away. For the uh, money these cost now, you can buy a seventy-five Sumacron and have money left over for a ninety Sumerit. <laughs> really, um, but if you are really really interested in a telephoto M lens that's gonna give you a, both a vintage look and also a very, very soft, quick focus fall off rendering. This is really the only one that's gonna do it. Because mm -hmm. the 75 Noctilux is it's a lot sharper, sharper yeah. in the corner than this is at the center wide open. I mean, it's by a lot. Um, and, but, and it's half a stop faster. And it's half a stop faster, yeah. Mm -hmm. So certainly plenty of character. You know, it's a 0.8 minimum focus distance, 0.8 meters, which is pretty good, very good. Um, yeah, I like these. They're different. They have a nice retractable hood. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a nice blend of of modern and and still vintage. Uh, let me take off that cap here. This one is six bit coated, which is pretty nice too. Um, but again, as these have become relatively valuable compared to what they were five six years ago, you have to think about that as you're adding. If you're going to add one to your arsenal, it's not just now about do I want a seventy five one four. It's how does this fit into my budget and my current lenses and you know the look that I'm going for. But there's really nothing else like it. Um, the F1 Noctilux, which uh, this is based on, the 50 Noctilux, is the closest thing. But this is a little bit sharper, and in my experience. They, uh, you know, the, the extra focal length gives you that, really that compression that you don't get with the 50. So, you know, I had it on the SL2 today, and I had it on the N10 Monochrome. I had more fun with it on the N10 Monochrome. I wasn't worried about aberration, um, chromatic aberration or color fringing, anything like that. I could just enjoy the bokeh and I could enjoy the rendering, I could enjoy the vignetting a lot more than I would on the SL2. So I probably wouldn't use this on the SL2. David, if you're watching this, I'd be curious what you, which camera you like this on best, since this is your lens. <laughs> I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna let him touch it and drop it, I promise. Um, and 
so yeah, I'd be curious to know if, if David or whoever else uses this, um, what camera of the ones you own you prefer using this on? Because I would say the an M monochrome in, in the world of digital is where it's the most fun, at least for me. Oh. So. And while you're on the subject, yes. can you compare the, the relative size of the 75? Oh, sure. sure can. So this one and? So this is, this so let's get a little, little close-up action going on. I, I, might, only, I might have to chip in. I only two at once here. So we've got, there we go. 75 Lux, 75 Apo, 75 Sumerit. So in order from biggest to smallest, this is quite heavy. This is uh, 560 grams. This is 430 grams, and that is 325 grams. So considerably lighter as you go down the range. Let's show them the fronts here. You can really see this is an e a 60 millimeter filter, 49 millimeter, 46 millimeter. So it got dramatically smaller. Um, the 75 Lux is a heavy lens. It's not as heavy as the 75 Noctilux, which I'll hold here, but it's certainly, oh, I'm doing a bad job. There we go. Uh, thank you. 75 Noctilux, you know, is obviously much bigger and twice the weight. So look at the difference in size there. Um, it's an interesting lens. I mean, it's, I just, I wouldn't use it solely with the rangefinder either. I would probably be reliant on a Visaflex or a similar because if you miss wide open at near, near like a meter or less, if you miss by even a millimeter, it's mush. It's like, oh, well, I missed it. So you're going to want to have live view helping you out for this lens, more Definitely. so than any other 75, without a doubt. Definitely. Uh, here's another. Jose, oh. Jose's just hanging out over there. Yeah, so and, and <laughs> actually, <laughs> so, so David answered you. Oh, what did David say? What did he say? He says, I love it, the 75 mm -hmm. Lux. I love it on the monochrome. OK. At F4 on the beach, it is incredible drawing. Oh. It also is great with film at 1.4 because it's more forgiving with the depth of the negative, right? The grain, the yeah, depth. Yeah. Um, yellow filter, I assume you mean. And, yep, and yellow filter on the M10 monochrome for a little extra contrast. Yeah. Well, and, and yes, and yes, <laughs> on the Visiflex, for, he's, he's given a thumbs up, like, yeah, got to use a Visiflex with it. Yeah. So that's from the owner who actually loaned it, the lens. Yes. So, so thanks, so David. Has, Appreciate yes. getting, getting back to us right away. Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. Um, All right, this, let's keep moving on. What else we got? This, this is actually, Jim's got a really interesting question. Okay. Uh, which is, if you own the SL2 and the 24 to 90, mm -hmm. so far so good. I like I like where this is going. <laughs> this is a good setup. Uh, would you buy an M lens, and would it render different, or will a 75 or 90 Summicron SL be similar? You can take take this one. Ooh, um, okay. Right off the bat, I just the 75 90 Summicron Apo SLs. I know we're not talking about SL lenses, but go to our SL video to get more. Go to the SL that. video yes, about that. Yes. But those are going to be sharper, higher resolving, everything, you know, less distortion, less chromatic aberration, less everything than anything on this table. Uh, they are the latest and greatest in terms of technology that Leica has in optics, and probably more so than anyone else. The, the Apple Summicron SLs are, are the current standard. There really is nothing better at this point. That being said, maybe that's not what you want. Maybe that's not what you need. In fact, I could tell you that, you know, let, let's take the Apple Summicron SL 75 millimeter versus say the 75 millimeter Apo M or the 75 millimeter uh, Noctilux 1.25. I think both of the M lenses would probably be better for video if you're shooting people because they're going to be more pleasing in terms of the, the skin rendering. You know, let's say for cine applications, you know, this lens is incredibly hard to beat, even with dedicated cine lenses. This is awesome. I've actually tried this for, for video shooting people, and it's awesome. So if you're using your SL2 for video like I am, uh, yeah, there's a great reason to use an M lens. Because you're not always looking for that extra res resolving power. Think about this. Um, video, 4K is only 8 megapixels. You don't actually need the same level of sharpness that you do for 47. So it depends on your use. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, if you're just after highest resolving power and less the, the least amount of aberrations possible, the SL Prime is going to get you there. And I think the 24 to 90 at 75 is, is already going to be so good. Better than any modern 75, it's short of the 75 Noctilux, I would say. And that, and that too. 
So I think there's a pretty good reason to get, say, I mean, I, I would cut the difference. If you're not looking for, for the budget of the of the Noctilux, yeah. personally, I, I think this, also look at the size of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the 75 Apo M makes for an incredible addition to an SL kit, both for video and stills yeah. and for portraiture. I think this is really nice. Nice. All right, why don't we let Jose do some work? Uh, he's he's drinking, uh, drinking a beer over there, chilling. Not doing anything. I think he's napping. I think he's. I think he may be asleep. I think that's what's going on. <laughs> what do you got for us, Jose? When you're ready. No, I'm just chilling and, and learning today. Oh, I see. So, that's fine. Back. All right. <laughs> so you guys touched on the subject earlier, but I think maybe you could expand on it. Um, any tips for getting steady shots with telephoto lenses on an M? Sure. Uh, well, I gave. If you you want to rewind the film ten minutes, uh, I was explaining getting into that more athletic shooting posture mm -hmm. of you know, separating your feet a little bit, bending at the waist, bending your knees slightly, and, and leaning into your shots. And, um, and then I'm gonna let Josh talk, not just technique. But hardware. Uh, actually, hardware. And, and while you're setting that up, I'm gonna yes. give one other tip yes. for getting sharper pictures. So we've got the stance, and that's gonna stop this motion. It's also gonna lock you down to be a little steadier that you can handhold slower. Mm -hmm. But that being said, there is no substitute for shutter speed. So true. And I would, my tip is this, embrace and love auto ISO. Auto ISO is your friend, especially when we're now getting to cameras like the M10 and the M10 monochrome that shoot ridiculously clean at 64, 8,000, 10,000 ISO. Okay, no longer are we limited by film where you were shooting 200 speed film and you, you, know, you have to shoot super slow or super wide open. Here's what you can do. Set auto ISO, and you can dial in your minimum shutter speed to a 250th or a 500th. Are they, do they call it maximum shutter speed? It's like the verbiage always confusing. The verbiage is a little you weird. You should say it, we should, because I got this wrong all the time, we should be right before I, we... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check that. Yeah, because I always should never remember. Uh, okay. Maximum it, exposure time. It is. Maximum, maximum, ex yeah. Yeah. maximum exposure time, yes. which is another way of saying your minimum number. But maximum meaning, in the, this translation, the longest shutter open period, which is the smaller number. Uh, so what I'd suggest for using a 75 or a 90 is, is go to 250th. And if you really want to make sure that you're sharp, if you're subject moving or if you're a little bit shaky and had maybe a few too many coffees at mm -hmm. lunch, you can set it to 500th of a second. Mm -hmm. And in daylight, you're still going to be shooting at pretty low ISO. Uh, and what a lot of people don't realize is you can use auto ISO both with aperture priority mode on the M as well as full manual. So you can, let's say you don't want to have to be changing your maximum exposure time setting in your ISO menu. You can actually set 500th on the dial, set 5.6 or whatever aperture you want to use on your lens and be in auto ISO. And what will happen is the camera will actually raise up your ISO to give you the correct exposure. Yeah, it's which sort of like cool. it's it's shutter priority and aperture priority at the, at same, the time. same time. At the same time, it is. I mean, that's yeah. what it is. It's like it's not. It's like the perfect balance of getting to control aperture and shutter speed mm -hmm. without having to always be changing your ISO. Like yeah. you're basically guaranteed the correct exposure, short of some ludicrously no. massive swing in light. You know. And I know you got to say it because yes. you got to say it almost every episode. Oh, of course. Well, I'll always take. A sharp picture that's grainy over a blurry picture that has no noise. So you may say, I don't want to go to ISO 6400 because there's grain. So you'll shoot it at 800, then it'll be blurry because your shutter speed was too slow. I'll take it at 6400 and I'll have it tack sharp. Which one is someone's going to go, oh, it's blurry. I'm sorry. So, um, all right. Yeah. I, no, I mean, I think that's, that's the best advice that we always kind of assume everyone sort of took and realized, well, no, it's a, it's a bit of an unusual feature mm -hmm. because. Mm -hmm. It, as the cameras have gotten newer and better, we've been able to take advantage of that as the ISO performance has improved. I mean, let, let's be real for a second. You can shoot the M10 monochrome clean, like like squeaky clean to 32,000 ISO. Yeah. Read David's uh, comparison on Red Dot Forum if you haven't, because yeah. it's wild. It's insane. Yeah. So, so, so why don't you tell us what right, are the so, kind of more mechanical yeah. things that you yeah. can do? So this is... Um, this setup that I'm, that I'm holding is actually the setup I use for handheld M telephoto lens shooting. So there's 
three components here, if we can get a close up uh, on this M10 um, that I've got. So number one, I have the M10 hand grip, which gives you the bump on the front. I'll show it here. There the you bump go. on the front, there it is, right there. Number two, on the hand grip, I have the finger loop. This is an optional item that doesn't come with it. It threads into, it's a long thread, so it doesn't come loose, hold on. There. That's by design. Yes, so it threads into this hole, and this is compatible with any of the grips that like it currently makes, so CL or M or Q. Q2. Q2, yep. yep. So this finger loop comes in three sizes. This is a medium. Let's thread that in there, hold on. So, okay, so we've got the M10 hand grip, we've got the medium finger loop, and I've got the M10 thumb support, or you could use the, wait, there it is, use the thumbs up depending on your ergonomic preference. So M10 hand grip, finger loop, thumb support. And what that does is I take my two middle fingers here, I lock them in the finger loop, and I've got my front fingers wrapped around the grip, my thumb is in the thumbs up, and my shutter button finger is on the shutter button. And here, I am locked in. There's no strap on this camera, I will not drop this. You can actually hold it by the finger loop confidently. Doing a bad job, there we go. Uh, and then just kind of grab it again. This is great with a wrist strap as well. Mm. So you can get the wrist strap on one side, it comes out right through here, it locks around your wrist. This thing is not going anywhere. So if you want to be as stable as possible, you could also add a uh, soft shutter release as well, which I use sometimes, depending on my mood. Uh, that'll really help you as well. So these three pieces, or if you don't like the finger loop, these two pieces, the grip and the thumbs up, are gonna give you the ultimate sort of grip because depending on the size of your hands and just the way your hands hold the camera, everyone's different. You may find that you just can't get as firm a grip as you want or your fingers are kind of like, you don't know where to, they don't know where to fall. So this setup is gonna lock you in. Yeah. And you're gonna be that much steadier when the camera's up to your eye because your hand is just there. Every finger is doing something, every mm -hmm. finger has a foothold or Finger hold. A finger hold. <laughs> a finger hold, if you will. So grip, loop, thumbs up. Now, I will say there's only one drawback to this, which is? Well, you can't what? use the VisaFlex. Right. But let's back up for a second. Let's say you loved having the thumbs up or thumb support because of the grip it added, but you also want to use the VisaFlex. The hand grip and the finger loop, maybe they don't quite, can I grab that VisaFlex? Maybe they don't quite make up for having the thumb support out on the camera, but it's a nice way to have grip and to have the Visa Flex at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm not giving up all my grip. I'm st I still have the hand grip on, and I've got the Visa Flex as well. So this is a good compromise if you want to have both. So definitely well said. And uh, why don't you explain also those mm -hmm. finger loops? They yes. come in three sizes. Yeah, I, I mentioned that quickly, but I'll, I'll yeah. elaborate. Uh, small, medium, and large. This is a medium. Um, you should try them before you commit. But small is pretty small. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Most people go for medium. Yeah, medium, yeah, depending on the size of your hands. My hands are normal. Average. Yeah. yeah. So slightly larger than average. Yeah. Whatever it is, it's it's um, and there's still room in here for my fingers. So you yeah. You just gotta feel you gotta try it. It's the only way. Um, so again, this setup for me, really nice. Anyway, what's Great. next? Any any good questions in the comments before I bother Jose some more? It's over here. All right, fire away. Is lens calibration more? Oh no, I think we already about touched that, on yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, do all M cameras have 135 millimeter frame lines? Mm, I mean, define all. I'd say all modern cameras do, but uh, there's recent cameras that have different viewfinders. So, for instance, uh, if you have an M7 with a 0.58 viewfinder, it does not have 135 frame lines. It maxes out at 90. And the reality is, because it's such a wide field of view, uh, a 135 frame line would be so tiny. But I do have a workaround for that, for the three people watching that uh, have 0.58 finders. You can actually use the, and I've, I've done this, you can use the range finder patch itself, uh, the focusing patch, as your approximate 135 frame lines on a 5.8 finder. So there's your there's your analog workaround for the day. Yeah. Um, uh, um, Jim, we, we actually covered 75 Noctilux versus 90 Simulux. Yep. Um, so rewind or when we're done, and you'll see we I talked about it um, quite a while. So sorry, that was a comment. To yeah, I just like I did. Well, I don't want to forget to mention it. So, <laughs> so yeah, um, basically all the modern M10, M240, um, they, M9, they all have 135 frame lines. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. So if you shoot 135, do not get a .58 M6, M7, or MP. Or else, I mean, maybe you want you to because they're better for wide lenses. Yeah, but I'm saying if you if you're 
want to com um, compose precisely, get a, a, get a 0.85. Yeah, you get, get a 0.85 or even a 0.72. So, yeah. a good question. All right. From Daryl, can the same bar look be duplicated in post? I mean, anything can be duplicated in post, Oof. but the question is how much, how much time do you want to spend on it? And let's say I can't do that in post. I don't know how to do that in post yeah. to make it look like an impressionist painting. And the thing is, the more you edit a file, the more it breaks down. Mm. The more banding you may get or noise or color or not. Um, um, what am I thinking of? The, the fringing. Fringing? Yeah, I don't know. The more artifact you're going to get. Artifacting, so, yeah. So as you try massaging and editing and filtering an image to get it to look like what the fan bar may give you optically out of the camera, you're giving up a lot of that image quality you were getting from shooting a Leica to begin with. So if your goal is to have an image look like a fan bar, get a fan bar. Get a fan bar. If it's something you're not going to do a lot, rent a fan bar. If it's something you're going to do once a year, Okay, fine. Buy some, you know, Lightroom filters, and maybe you'll get somewhere or, new there. I don't know. Or make friends with someone who has a fan bar and be like, "Hey, by the way, can I just <laughs> can try I borrow your fan yeah. bar?" Yeah, exactly. That's what we do. That's I mean, we, yeah, exactly. So thanks, Albert. Um, <laughs> so I guess the question, the answer is maybe, but at what cost? Yeah, I wouldn't even try. It's yeah. it's it's so unique a look that I think is. I mean, obviously nothing's impossible. I mean, half the movies you see now don't even exist. I mean, they're all it's people yeah. standing in the middle of nothing. Uh, so yeah, of course you can make it, but yeah, at what cost? How much time? Yeah, exactly. It's a lot more fun to go out and shoot pictures than to try to make pictures in the computer. Yeah. Sorry. So yeah, that's it. I mean, it's a good question. Um, sorry you joined. Jim, Jim, Jim was late. It's okay, Jim. We, we did answer <laughs> your question. You so. can rewind. I answered it specifically so you could see it because uh, I know we had talked about it like, yesterday. So um, but uh, that's a good question anyway. Yeah. Um, Question from David. Yes. Can you talk about the old 75 and 90 lenses? Well, well, we talked about the one right. old 75. That's all too broad, I think. Yep. I mean, we, we covered a lot already on that. I mean, if there's a specific uh, 90 or you want to know about, I mean, 75, they haven't, they've only made one, two, three, four, five 75s. That's Lux, it. Lux, Apo, Sumacron, 2.5 Sumer, 2.4 Sumer, Knocked look. That's it. Yeah. There's Leica no has a much longer history making 90 millimeter. Right. 90s lenses. have been making since the OG, the original days. It's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. in the 50s. They've been making 90s. Anything pre teleomerid? Mm, no. I mean, sure, it works, but man, no contrast, impossible barrel. I mean, like this is a 90 LMR from forever ago, and this thing is horrible to use. I mean, the whole barrel turns when you turn the focusing ring. Uh, I have to thank Don Goldberg for letting me borrow this for him. I hear I am bashing his lens. But, um, you know, the aperture has no detent. I mean, you know, these are fun and they're really inexpensive and they're light. And and, and this is and extra it has, special, yeah. It has a Vulcanite band actually around the back. Uh, I'll take the cap off here. Uh, you can sort of see it. But this is not a good lens, I'm sorry to say. Like, just objectively. And if we even go a generation new or two newer, just stay on the coast of Jose, um, the first generation of the 90 teleomerate, this is better, and it, it has a little more modern design where it doesn't, the whole barrel doesn't rotate. But, you know, if you're after that vintage look, okay, fine. But otherwise, I am gonna go newer if I can. Although I gotta say, that one, especially in chrome with that neural focusing, is yeah, just here's, awesome. Yeah, they came, they came in, in, in chrome first and then they made them in black. So this is the same lens, 90 teleomerate in uh, black and chrome. These feel really cool. Um, the focus is nice and smooth. I mean, they're good lenses if you want something vintage and 90, that's a 2.8, but I wouldn't uh, have as my only 90 if I enjoyed shooting with that focal length. You know, it's really more just something to play with. And then we can even go to an even more ridiculous 90 Super, or 90 Elmar collapsible, which you cannot collapse on a uh, on a digital camera because it will damage everything. Yeah, sa um, safety tip here. We got to talk yeah, about rubber this. bands. Yep. Uh, rubber bands around here if you're going to use this. So if you do collapse it by accident, it won't go past that point. Uh, we talked about this before on other live streams. Um, you know, again, fun, inexpensive. You know, different a different look. Kind of like you know the same concept as the fan bar, but very low contrast. A lot of chromatic aberration. A lot of vignetting. Um, you know, I don't think you'd be satisfied with it all the time. It's just something fun to kind of pull out of the bag and go nuts. And, and we have a question here about yeah. uh, a 90 Tele Elmerit 2.8. They've made uh, four versions of the Tele Elmerit. Um, they had, I'm just looking at my notes because I want to make sure I get this right. 
the fat and the thin, this is a fat one because it's thicker, mm -hmm. um, from the 80s or the 60s into the late 90s. No, sorry. The 60s into the 70s. And then they had the second version of the teleomerate, which was all the way to 1990. That's the one I don't have right now, which I know a lot of people like. The yeah. teleomerate thin. And this is um, what replaced it. Yeah, so it's it's the predecessor to this. The teleomerate compared to this, the, the 90 omerate version 2, if you will, what David likes, this build quality in this lens, far superior. It's bigger, does have the built-in hood, which the teleomerate does not. Um, but it's a modern vintage. Yeah, yeah. Teleomerate yeah. is more vintage, much lower contrast, more vignetting. Different lens, very small, very light. Good value, mm -hmm. although they are going up. Mandler design, um, if I recall correctly. So, yep. Um, I don't hate it. <laughs> I just, you know, I just feel like it's anything that vintage is not going to be the only ver um, lens in that focal length I'm going to have if mm -hmm. I want something that's like super sharp with modern rendering. Yeah, that's my that's my spiel on that. What else we got in there? Anything poking around? Yeah. Uh. Jay, you should watch 10 minutes ago. We talked about the 75 Sumalux. Um, <laughs> so we did talk about it. We did talk about the 75 yeah. Sumalux yeah, 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 we did. At, at length. I know, it's hard to, I know everyone has got lives to live, but that's why these, these videos always live on our channel. Yeah, you can always rewatch later. Whenever you um, want. Are, is Gabe going to be uh, timestamping yeah. this? Yeah, yeah so and we'll be timestamped by yeah. questions so you can skip to whatever question you want. So. Uh, so, okay, here's another differences between the 75. Apo Summicron and the 75 millimeter Sumerit, which we, we touched on that a little bit, but yeah. I know you tested these specifically. Yeah, I mean, 75 Sumerit is actually sharper on the corner, is wide open. It has very little character compared to what the 75 Apo has. 75 Apo being based on the 514 uh, Aspheric really renders beautifully mm -hmm. wide open. It's got a nice, soft sort of fall off vignettes, really, really nicely, not too much, not too little. Um, stop down, it's way sharper than the Sumerit, I think. Uh, not way sharper, but sharper. A little bit. The Sumerant is lighter and smaller and faster to focus, you know, infinity to minimum. It has a, almost as good a reproduction ratio, although not as good. Barely, so, yeah. Depending on your objective or depending on your budget, and if you're shooting a lot of portraits wide open, Sumacron, definitely. If you're doing landscape at f4, 5.6, or you're doing, you know, other stuff that, that doesn't require that f2, Sumerant. Sumerant. Yeah. That's, yeah. Sumerant. Of course, you can't buy a Sumerant new anymore. At least not easily. Where the super crowd you can, so it's another argument for what might make the decision a little easier, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a question. Um, it's a little bit um, not off topic, but it's that's okay. The thirty-five echo D in mm. comparison to the seventy-five Apple. Um, Wayne is asking about the bokeh. Is it similar? Totally I mean, different. No. Totally different. Not I mean, you're, you're, the difference is that just the like measurable amount of depth of field is so much less on a seventy-five than a thirty-five. Um, I, I think I could kind of see where the question comes from. Like, do they have you, a similar look in terms of matching together? I would say no. I don't think so. But I I do use them together. Yeah, and yeah. they they work well together. Work but really no, well they're, together. They're they're very different. If you want something that's like the thirty five one four, uh, the mm. ninety Sumalux is the closest you're going to get in terms of the way the bokeh falls. Even though it's they are very different, I know that's price point is a little crazy. But I'm just saying, like, in my experience, thirty five lux and ninety lux are closer. Than the thirty-five lux and the seventy-five apple. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and in my experience, I'd say that the the seventy-five cron is definitely smoother bokeh. Well, I mean, it is twice the focal length. Yeah. Uh, the thirty-five can be not as smooth. It can be a little more nervous uh, relative to the seventy-five, which tends to be very very smooth. So that's sort of the my take on it. Yeah. Do we have do we have uh, audio issues with Jose. Nobody wants to hear you, Jose. That's the problem. <laughs> Not that I'm kidding. We all want to hear you. We need you. Um, I guess repeat that question. I don't think, yeah, they hear me on that, the last question. Which question? The 35 and the 75. Oh, the question was, yeah. how does the 35 Sumalux, or, or it was, um, does the 35 Sumalux FLE render similar to the 75 Apo? That was the question. Yeah, sorry. Um, oh, I like that last question. What do we have here? Because I have strong opinions on that one. Uh, from James Kong, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read it out if you like. How critical is using a lens hood with telephoto lenses? My 90 millimeter Sumerit manual actually recommends always using the hood, but I much <laughs> prefer the size without it. Hmm. If you've ever watched our videos before, I think you know our opinion on hoods. Yes, but I actually tested this uh, today because yeah. we, I shot kind of like with a window just out of frame to mm. test flare. There was no difference. It, to me, 
especially modern optics are so flare resistant already. The hood serves more for protection. Exactly. If you're afraid of knocking the edge of the lens. David and I do not use hoods. Um, the exception unless, being, they're, unless they're built in. Right. With the integrated hoods, sure. I mean, they just slide in and out. Even then, I don't use it all the time because I use a polarizer a lot, which I need to adjust and the mm -hmm. hood gets in the way. There's no damage to your images or there's no detriment to image quality. It just makes the lens bigger. And, uh, and some of them too big. Like, yeah. take this 90 Sumerit. Yeah, yeah that's, okay. a good, uh, that's a good reference. So if you take this 90 Sumerit, and I'm just going to... Wait, Jose's going to get a little closer on there this. There we go. We got it, right? Yeah, there it is. Okay, so here's a 90 Sumerit. Now, I've got the hood here reversed, which is pretty cool that the 90 Sumerit design, they really up their, their hood design around this time. Whoop, other way. Okay, so you can see the lens by itself is pretty small, which is what we like about the Sumerits. And the shade's not huge by itself, but once we put it on there, once we try to put it on there. <laughs> You're doing it backwards, there you go. Okay. Visually, you can just see how much larger that lens now looks. Yeah. And honestly, it for performance, it's just not necessary. It's nice because protecting. Yeah. If you ever bump into anything, the lens hood is going to get dinged, and this is easy to replace, like a cell's replacement of these if you want. Um, if it gets chewed up on the front from going in and out of your camera bag, or you know you're you're carrying it around on your hip and you you bang into walls all the time. Well, great. The hood is going to protect the lens. And this is a whole lot easier to replace as a single piece than trying to replace your front element. Yeah, I'll say. OK, so, so it's basically, you can come back to me, Jose. OK, yeah, I mean, basically, think of this more as protection mm -hmm. than necessary or even impacting image quality right, at right, all. Right. Yeah, this, this is, I, I look at this strictly as protection. Maybe on the on the earlier vintage lenses, it would have made a difference. Maybe, but maybe. Really but, not. Like I don't think. Yeah. They well, look cool. They look cool though. So there you go. Two points for looking cool. And it's metal. Yeah. So you got that. What else we got? Anything Jose wants to ask? Right. We can always repeat it, so yeah, just in case. No, actually Mark says uh, that Jose is clear now. Oh okay. Excellent. <laughs> um, Ted is asking, why isn't there a hundred and thirty five millimeter two point eight? There is. There is. It's right there. there the, is. the reason there isn't a modern one is because look how big this monster of a lens is. Oh, you got it. No, this is careful. Okay. I got it. Yeah, you say that. You can drop it. On this one, actually, has a very unique dual telescoping hood, which Ooh, is kind fancy. of unique. Fancy. Yeah. So it actually has a two-stage, uh, which is a little. So this, stiff. Is a, this is a 135 Elmerit from yep. you know the late 60s, early 70s. It is uh, based on actually a Leica Flex lens, so based on an SLR lens. And you'll notice it has this little doodad on the top that's actually integrated into the lens. That is a basically a 1.4x magnifier built in to the lens to allow you to see the 135 frame lines clearer and make the range gonna, I'll put it on the camera. larger. It is huge and quite ungainly, which is why there isn't a modern version of the 135 2.8, because it's huge. <laughs> um, look there at that go. thing. Holy moly. Put the whole hood out so like, they can see like the full size. Well, I'm trying to make it pretty. No, no. Make it look awesome. Do it. Do, yes. do, 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 yeah, do. Look at the size of that. They're ridiculous. Yeah. It looks awesome. It looks awesome. But, you know, ugh. and it's not even that good of a lens. Sorry, Don, who lent me this. But, um, you know, it's... I, although I have to say, it's a really cool idea to have the magnifier built in because it does make it easier to focus. That rangefinder yes. patch gets 40% larger. How does it look on you're holding it? How does it look through there? If you look through it, can you actually take advantage of it or does it look like mush? Um, It's. Um... <laughs> Yeah, nah, nah. Uh, it's not bad. It's it's you get a little bit of a tunnel effect uh, if I'm honest. Yeah, let me see. Let me see. Yeah, so it's it's definitely it's like a a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> that's ridiculous. I'm being I mean, I'm it being does nice. Work. It does work. It I mean, does. It, it does. does. It's kind of it does. Kind of, oh, the focus rate, like the throw on this lens is ludicrously long. Yeah. Oh it, my and goodness. And it's a good thing it's knurled, otherwise, because yeah, it's pretty you, stiff. Oh also. My goodness. Yeah. This is um, it has a it has its own tripod. Foot on well, it. I mean, listen. That's... Come on. Let's be fair. Let's be fair. Yeah, but that so this is what, yeah. So this is um, again a lens you would get for fun. It's it just, is fun. It's it is not fun. practical, but it is fun. These are not expensive. Um, just uh, something to watch out for on these lenses. If yeah. you if you do want to pick one up, make sure. And Jose, get a close up on that, just so I can. So, do you see how the 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 camera plate here and the uh, the goggles are are parallel? 
I have seen far too many of these lenses where I don't know if it got dropped or torqued or something, but these are not sitting parallel. Mm. Uh, this, the goggle piece is actually bent. Uh, either, either, you know, this way, kind of um, left and right, or, or uh, up and down in, in this orientation. And the problem with the goggles not being aligned is that you're never going to get it in focus. Yeah, it's going to drive you nuts. Ever. Yeah. So, so do make sure that it, if you pick up and use one of these, that you double check and make sure that it is, it is actually square to the camera because too many of them are not. Yeah. Good question. What else we got, Jose? I had a question here. Still fun um, lens. This is a good question. With megapixels increasing, cropping a 50 millimeter starts to overlap with a 75 or 90. Agree or disagree? No, even with if you take a the same resolution, let's say from a high-res camera and a low-res camera, and you crop one to look like a 75, and you shoot a 75 on the other one, they're always going to look different because as you increase focal length, you increase the compression, meaning you're bringing things closer together, and you decrease depth of field. So simply cropping a 50 to a 75, it works in a pinch. The Q2 does that, but it's not going to look like a 75 millimeter lens. No. You're always going to get a simply a 50 cropped. If you want the effect that a telephoto gives you, again, we talked about this at the top of the show, compression and separation, you need to actually shoot a telephoto lens. Correct. So that's how you really get that benefit. You know, no matter how very, many megapixels yes. you have, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Cropping, you're simply making that lens show less. You're not actually changing the effect. Good, good question, though. I mean, I like that. What else we got? We're ki we're killing it right now. What time is it? Oh well, we got time. We're doing good. How do I use the 1.25 and 1.4 magnifiers on my M10? Oh, good question. You want you want you want to show that one, Dave? You want me to? Show no, it? you can show it. Okay. Um, so, I mean, yes. yeah. We'll the, talk about well, what they are, right? And so, then I want to show how it works. So while Josh gets set up there, well, I'm pretty much ready. So okay. Just, yeah. <laughs> uh, basically, just like I, I mentioned in the goggles, it gives you a 1.4 magnifier. Except this is a huge magnifier, and you're getting that tunnel view. So if you want to change, I should back up just a second. Yeah. The standard magnification on on M, uh, let's say on a film camera is 0.72, on on a modern M10 rangefinder is 0.73. 0.73, very close. Let's just call it 0.72, about. Um, so with a telephoto lens, that frame is pretty small. And also, as we talked about, your margin of error is also a lot less because your depth of field is, is shorter. And if you're moving, it's even worse. Uh, the magnifiers allow you to make the both the rangefinder patch larger as well as your frame lines. So you can actually see what's in your frame. And Leica has two. They have a 1.25 to give you 25% more magnification and a 1.4 mm -hmm. to give you 40% more magnification. But I'll pick it up from here. I'll, I'll, yeah. So we talked about this a lot in the M10 uh, live stream, which seems like forever ago. Leica increased the size of the rangefinder window, the viewfinder of the M10, from all previous generation M cameras, which means accessories like the 1.25 and 1.4 magnifiers um, they're really, really tiny. I'll try... Yeah, hold them up against your shirt. Uh, I think that should work, right? Yeah, okay. Try that. The, these, which screw into the eyepiece of the camera, they won't fit on Maybe. the M10 anymore right. because it's... Yeah. it's mm, I can hold it. <laughs> it's okay. If I try to screw it onto the M10... Let's see if I can... Here we go. It just... It's too... The, the viewfinder is too big. It won't screw in. So, like it doesn't make M10 specific viewfinder magnifiers, so what they do make is what's called, keep the close up here, Jose, while I show the box. This is the, uh, there we go, Leica Rangefinder Thread Adapter for the M10 and all the variants, M10D, M10P, M10 Monochrome. So what this is, it comes in a little leather case like that. When you pull out of the box, you pull this out like this. You get this cool little holder thing. And in the middle is, get it out of here, on this white cardboard, is basically a bushing. You can think of this as a step-down ring for the M10 to size the M10's viewfinder to the size of the 240 and all the other models, meaning diopters, angle viewfinder, and viewfinder magnifiers will work. I normally don't recommend using this for things like diopters because they do make M10-specific ones because you're giving up that increased viewfinder size. by You're basically cropping it down. But a viewfinder magnifier is doing that already. So you're really not actually losing anything by using the thread adapter 
with the viewfinder magnifier because the magnifier is already decreasing the size of the viewfinder, so there's no detriment. So if you want to make the rangefinder patch larger and make the 90 and 135 millimeter frame lines take up more of the viewfinder, meaning larger, use a 1.25x or 1.4 magnifier. I would say if you're shooting 50, 75, 1.25. 90 and 135, 1.4 would be my advice. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, so you do need the rangefinder thread adapter to make the magnifiers work. And it comes with, just so I can show you guys real quick, if you're asking, the other thing in the bottom here, can we get a close up on that, Jose, is this little metal thing. This is actually a wrench. Yeah, we can get it out of here, here we go. Doesn't look like a wrench, but it is. So one side kind of grabs the thing, the adapter, the, the thread adapter from the outside and releases it. The other side grabs the inside and tightens it in. So it's a double-sided, cool little stainless steel wrench. So anyway, that is the M10 rangefinder thread adapter and how you use viewfinder magnifiers on your M10 or M10 variant. Okay. Good, good demo, Josh. Whew, that was fun. Was, that was very tiny and little and finicky, but super useful. What else we got? Let's see. Um, how much has Leica improved their 90 millimeter lenses over time? I think you touched on that a little earlier in terms of the the early Elmerits versus kind of the middle range Elmerit, you know, now up to the the Simulux. Uh, obviously, yeah. we've seen a, a pretty pretty consistent progression in terms of image quality uh, from from when they started. And I mean, let's talk just talking about M lenses, not screw mount lenses, but you know, from the mid 1950s till now, obviously there's been a ton of technology improvements. Yeah. And you know, I, I think that telephoto lenses maybe haven't improved to as much of a degree as say 35s or 28s because I mean, let, let's be real, the earliest wide angle lenses were, were um, <laughs> we talked about this last week, we're, two we're, weeks ago. We're, we're less than desirable. Let's yeah. be diplomatic. On a modern, on a modern camera. Yeah, let, let's be diplomatic there. You know, so they had a lot more room to improve. Uh, 90s were already decent, uh, even back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, they've only gotten better, but the amount of improvement, I think, is right. maybe not as significant. Um, I'll tentatively kind of agree with that, with the exception of the 90 Sumalux and the 90 Macro, mm. which wide open are so good compared to any other 90 that it's almost mind blowing. Um, here's, but outside of those two, I would say it's a more gradual progression. Yeah. Um, especially stop down one or two stops. Mm -hmm. there, there is a pretty big, the biggest jump, uh, if you if sort of like all the 90s up to the 90 Elmerit, the, the latest version, and then the jump to the Apple Sumicron. Yeah. The jump to the Macro and the Sumerits, and then the jump to the Sumalux. But yeah. up until that, Last version of the Elmerit, there was a gradual progression. Right. It wasn't like huge leaps in performance. So, and that was over what four 40, or five generations, right? Yeah, forty years. Which, uh, which ultimately was about what was it, five or six generations? Uh, one, two, three, four generations. Yeah, yeah it was four generations. Yeah. yeah. So, good question yeah. though. Okay, what else we have? Okay, we have a quick one here from David. What is the difference between the Elmar Super Elmar and Elmerit lenses? Well, well, there's no Super Elmar. Yeah. Yeah. You want to take this one? Uh, yeah, sure. This <laughs> okay. is, yeah, no, okay, I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> to, okay. I, I didn't mean no, to jump in. No, it's fine, we both got it, it's fine. Okay, so there's no Super Elmar telephotos. Super Elmar usually indicates that it's an ultra wide angle lens. Uh, so a 21 would be a, a Super Elmar. Um, or, or an 18 is a, is a Super Elmar. So those are typically the ultra wide. Uh, and then in all of Leica, Elmar usually historically signifies f4 uh, as a maximum aperture in more modern times it's usually 3.8 so that's what elmar means and then sumicron well let's say elmerit is pretty much always 2.8 yeah i'd say i don't think there's any exceptions to that no. so elmerit is always 2.8 sumicron is always f2 and sumalux is usually 1.4 historically right. although there is um that that is a 90 Sumalux is yeah. 1.5, the Sumalux on the Q and the Q2 1. is 1.7. 7. Yeah. So, you know. so there's a little bit of variability in the Noctilux. Historically was F1, well, originally F1.2 and then right. F1, yes. and then 0. 0.95. Yes. And this Sumalux is, or I'm sorry, Noctilux is 1.25. Yeah. This one, yeah. the 75. So there's a little bit of play there, but generally speaking, you go in terms of speed, you have you know Elmar, Elmerit, 
Sumicron, Sumilux, Noctilux. Yeah. Um, actually, interestingly enough, the Elmeric term was first used for the 90 Elmeric, the first 90 Elmeric. Oh, was it? Was it? the first time they, ha- they made a 2.8 lens and called mm-hmm. it an Elmeric. So now they've had many Elmerics since then. Sure. 28 Elmeric yeah, still being made today, but that's where the term originated. Mm-hmm. I learned that recently. I was like, oh, that, that's cool. Pretty cool, yeah. 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 Random. That's a good question. So, yeah. So just to be clear, no super. Uh, yes. Although there is a there is a tele only designation, which is tell it. So sometimes you'll see apo something tell it. Yeah, T E L Y T. And that's still yeah. used on modern lenses. Yeah. So that just means that it's a telephoto. I right, think I got time for a couple more questions. So what else we got, Jose? All right. Technically, are long lenses easier or harder to design? I think easier to design for all things being equal. All things being equal. That's yeah. what I was getting at in terms of improvements. Yeah. I think that telephoto lenses, because inherently, the the light path is telecentric, meaning it comes straight in from the lens to the sensor instead of being, um, you know, at a high incident angle for for wide angles. So it's generally easier to handle uh, that that straight optical path than it is for extreme wides, for instance. You know, ultra wide angle lenses are the hardest to design. But I wouldn't say that, you know, a Sumilux 90 is easy to design. Right. There's a reason that Leica hasn't made one until the last couple of years right. in all of its history, because it's really, really, really hard yeah. to get that level of performance with that amount of light flux. In other words, that amount of light coming through the lens. It is orders of magnitude more difficult yeah. to make a 90 Sumilux i.e. 1.4 than a 90 Sumicron f2, even though it's one stop. 1.5. What's that? Uh, one point. <laughs> I just want anyone to comment. Like, ninety. Like, <laughs> yeah, ninety-one point five versus a Sumicron, which yeah. is a ninety f two. I yeah. I and I think the key phrase to take away from what David said is it orders of magnitude. It's not a just little harder. A little bit harder. It's so much more difficult, which is reflected in the lens's size. Yeah. And the lens's production levels yes. and the lens's price. Yes. When you're talking about these super super high end. Uh, yeah. In order lenses. to get that little performance, it's not just the design; it's also the manufacturing. Yeah. And the, the, tolerance the tolerances, yeah. optical and mechanical tolerances, are are so insanely high. Uh, they have a very low yield. That's why it's so hard to make them. And because if you have a high reject rate and you're using the most exotic materials, and it takes more time to make it, and you know a certain percentage of the ones you make get thrown away, well. It's expensive, yeah. and when you look at these two lenses, the 75 Noctilux and the 90 Sumilux, that's what you're. Oh wow, they are really heavy too. <laughs> 1100 grams, bro. Uh, each, <laughs> yeah. So, so that's what you're looking at. And if, if someone says, "Well, why is that so much money?" Well, that's why, because yeah. it's not just a little bit harder. Uh, it, it's a lot harder, not just the design, but also the production. Yeah. Okay. Good question, though. What else we got? Josh, earlier you mentioned that um, some lenses are based on other lenses. What do you exactly mean by that? Well, Leica doesn't have, like every single M lens ever been, has ever made is not a unique design into itself. Over the course of the 70 years they've been making M lenses and longer than that, they'll take designs from lenses that worked and improve upon it. So you may have, for example, the 75 Sumicron, which is on this camera, shares an optical design with the 514. It's obviously not exactly the same, because it's not a 50, it's a 75. But they took a, the optical layout of the 50 Lux and they made it into a 75. Yeah, the, the modified double gauss that was created for the 50 1.4, they repurposed it into the 75. It has one less element in it because, and it, it different spacing because yeah. it's 75. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about some of those lens terms, yeah. by the way, in our 35 and 50 videos. But yeah, so, so that's you. based on that. Uh, another one that we have on the table is the, the 75 yep. Sumilux, yep. which was based on the original F1 50 millimeter Noctilux. Mm-hmm. And uh, actually, there's a parallel that to that to those two sets of lenses. Interestingly, uh, the 50 millimeter F1 Noctilux, the original. Years later, Dr. Mandler actually created the the 75 1.4 because he decided, hmm, a 75 would be nice. And remember, Leica never had a 75 right. before. The first one. It was the first one. And of course, he made it as, a, as an exotic yeah. uh, with a very similar look to the Noctilux because it's almost the same optical design, just reconfigured. And uh, Peter Carba, who designed the 51.4 Summa Luxospheric, with the floating element, with the uh, modified double gauss design, he told he told me we were having a conversation. He said, "I was sitting in my kitchen on a Saturday, having coffee, staring out at the yard, and I thought of Dr. Mandler." And I was like, okay. And he says, "You know, 
he had an Octolux 50 millimeter and then he made a Sumilux 75. So I thought I should do the same. Why not have a 75 Subicron? Okay, so he did. Um, you know, I think Leica is a little different in that regard that the optical designers have a certain level of freedom to create products that they want to create, mm -hmm. not that are dictated by, you know, uh, a marketing team or a boardroom or whatever. Right. You know, this is a guy sitting here on a Saturday having <laughs> coffee and be like, hmm, I think this lens might be good and then actually make it. Yeah. 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 Very true. And, so and, that's uh, yeah. what I'm talking about. That's what we mean. If that makes sense. What do we got next? All right. We have a question from Mauricio. What is your experience with the 135 Apple Telet? Where does this lens shine? Well, we did talk about that, so just rewind to some time ago, because <laughs> um, I don't want to, you know, rehash yeah. necessarily. Although it's a great question, uh, David did cover that, so definitely, Mauricio. Yeah, hello, watch it. How you How are you doing, by the way? <laughs> yeah, but but we covered that already. <laughs> yeah, we did cover that. So not to dismiss the question; it's a good question, but we did cover it. So just rewind, and you'll find it. What else we got? Okay. Are any R system lenses usable on a digital M? Oh, I knew someone was going to ask this question. David and I talked about this. The short answer to that is, without um, making everybody who shoots R lenses hate me forever, there is no R lens that has an equivalent M lens focal length, 90, 50, 70, well, there's no 75, uh, th that I would use instead of its M counterpart if quality was my ultimate objective. Yeah, we talked about this exact question yeah. two weeks ago. Yeah, so R lenses are fun, they're unique, some of them are quite collectible, and they look they have their own rendering. But I'm not going to use an, an Apple Sumacron R90, which is it's quite good though. Good lens, but it's way bigger. I lose rangefinder coupling. I have to use Live View. I have to use the Visaflex. I'm not going to use it when I have access to so many great M90s. If I already owned one and I wanted to have some fun, sure. But I wouldn't have it buy an M10 and say to myself, I want to buy a 90 next. And I wouldn't buy an R Dr. L, a Visaflex, and an Apple Sumacron R90. I'd buy an Apple Sumacron M90, and then that's it. Yeah. And I'm good to go. Yeah, I mean, I, as a huge fan of the 90 Apo R, because yeah, I had one. amazing lens, yeah. Amazing, and it's not that, actually, small for a 90. It's uh, only a 60 millimeter filter size, yeah. and it's it's more like a 50 millimeter. But it, it's like the size of a Noctilux, actually. A 50 millimeter Noctilux, it's about the same size. Um, I actually still have a couple R lenses that I will use on my M, but they are not duplicated. So I have a, a 60 macro that I like, which works pretty well. And, uh, and we've talked about this. Yep. Just so we don't get we too talked about this, this during our macro, the M, during the M section. In the yeah. M uh, uh, videos, we did part one and two yep. many weeks and, ago. And so. the other lens I'd say is, let's say 135 is not long enough. Mm -hmm. I have a 180 Apo Telet, Tele Elmerit. Tele? Or, Ap or Apo Elmerit R. Apo Elmerit. They made a bunch of them, but you have an Apo Elmerit R. Apo Elmerit R. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's a 180 2.8, and it works really nicely on, on the M. So I don't use it a lot, but I certainly have used it, and I use it for the stuff that I want more reach because just like the question earlier of, well, can't you just crop? Couldn't I shoot a 135 and crop? Right. Yes. But what's better than that? Shoot a 180. Yeah, the real thing. Really the real thing. So real, the answer is yes, but uh, you're going to give up rangefinder coupling. You're going to give up size. You're going to give up convenience. Um, and they're not as good like as an M lens, as a modern M lens, sharpness yeah, wise. Yeah, not as good lenses. as a modern M lens. They're good, just not as good. Yeah. Okay, we have like two more questions maybe, and then yeah, we're 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 getting to the wind down part. Yeah, I think so. I think David mentioned this already, but somebody's asking about a uh, personal favorite long lenses. I already said mine. Yeah, he did. It's his 90 Um For me, 75 Noctilux. I love. I know it's a recent addition to the lineup. Before that, it was probably the 75 Sumacron. I like 75. The 75 Noctilux is amazing. <laughs> it's just, there's nothing else like it. M10 monochrome, M10, SL2, CL, you name it, that lens is just magic. It's so, so sharp. It's sharper than the 50 Apple, in my opinion, mm -hmm. 50 Apple M, but it renders like nothing, nothing, nothing else. So, Well, okay. you get both. It's technically precise and sharp and high resolving without giving up character. Yeah. Okay, let's do like one or two more. I keep saying that, but we got to sign off at some point. Anything else on our list that we had from people that submitted earlier? Um, it? You covered up pretty good. Let's see. Are there any other micro M lenses aside from the 90? No. No. Two versions of the 90 macro in, in M, and that's it. But what's what do we got here? Oh, 
That's a good question. Yeah. And I, and Specific I, to the lens we just talked about. Yeah. So the 90 macro, the question is, how is the subject isolation in bokeh on the 90 f4? So the 90 f4, it has bokeh, not a lot, not a lot of character to it. It's very clinical. It's very, like, shapes are easily defined. It's not a lot of, like, um, smooth transition from one shape to the next. It's pretty harsh transitions. You wouldn't use it for portraiture, probably, but for anything else, it's great. It's just not a lens that I'd use with that in mind. I'd rather have a 90 Apo or an, even a 90 Elmer for that. But mm -hmm. when I'm talking about performance and I, I want corner to corner sharpness, I don't want to have to think about it. And when I want something small, mm -hmm. because the 90 macro is very, very small. I also want to say, and David and I talked about this a little bit, and this is a super tiny. We'll talk about this more when we do a macro live stream. But the 90 macro M, because the barrel is collapsible, and because it is compatible with the macro adapter M, you actually have three focus adjustments possible I guess when you have the macro adapter M attached. What do I mean by that? I mean- This is the macro adapter M. Normally, when you attach a macro adapter to an M lens or an L Pro to the front of it, something to make it focus closer, you can really only focus from really, really close to really close. You have a very limited range. What if you say, well, the lens goes down to say 0.7 meters. I just want to focus at 0.4 meters. I don't want to focus at two inches, but there's no M lens that focuses at 0.4 meters. And I put a macro adapter on a 90 Sumerian and it goes down to just two to six inches and that's it. Well, because the 90 macro has that third adjustability, meaning it's collapsible section that David's adjusting now, this lens with the macro adapter attached gives you access to the full range from the very, very, very closest focusing distance with full macro enabled. That would be this. All yep. the way to infinity. But the caveat being, number one, you have to use live view. It's not rangefinder coupled. And number two, the collapsing mechanism isn't the most precise thing in the world, at least relative to how precise a focusing uh, ring is. But, but this is a underrated or under discussed feature, in my opinion, of the setup that David is holding in his hand. The ability to go from infinity all the way to super, super macro without taking off the macro adapter, without having any gaps, without having any breaks. You can focus at 0.5 meters, 0.2 meters, 10 inches, whatever you want. So this is really a great setup. And of course, it's crazy sharp, crazy sharp. I mean, I was blown away today when I tested this lens, how good this thing was. And I knew it was good, but man, I was really impressed. Again, not a lot of magic, no vignetting, there's no super focus fall off 90 apo whatever but that's not what it's for it's a mm -hmm. different tool for a different task that's it <laughs> i said enough it's a sleeper lens for I sure i said enough what else let's do one more let's see one more question and then yeah uh, i think then we can uh i think we are going to have to split up uh 35 and 50 into two videos if we can talk about telephotos for two hours i think we can yes you know. everybody wants I two separate videos for that's that. it 85 sumer x is a screw mount uh, lens i was given the opportunity yeah. to borrow a screw mount lens thank you gary 85 but I didn't because it's screw mount. And this kind of got a cult following, but it, it's a funky and I also lens. Was, I also was afraid I'd like it too much, so I didn't want to talk about uh, it. But Mauricio, I will call me next week and I'll tell you about it. It is, um, it's funky. Yeah. And it, that whole, the whole, the whole lens turns when you focus yeah. it. It's yeah. really weird. We're not going to get into it right now. Okay. Um, so see. we will cover, I, I also want to just really quickly thank everybody who, as usual, who helped us. Thanks guys. Get this video together. We have Gary and they'll just say, um, gotta uh, get, gotta give the air to say. Sure. And uh, Don and Albert and Kirsten, of course. And am I forgetting anyone? And uh, Rob and Chris over at Like USA for getting us that sweet, sweet 90 Sumalux. And um, I think I got everyone. I don't know if I, I missed so. them, I'm sorry. Just, I just want to thank because David and I, we have a lot of toys, but when we're talking about 70 years of like a history. We don't we have want, it all. We want all the toys. And we want to show as much as we can because we know everybody has questions right. and test. And test, right. Now, That's I, if in case you missed that, Josh tested yes. all of the lenses that you yes. see here yeah, head this, to head. This morning, I do what I, what I tend to do, if you're curious, and even if you're not, I'm going to tell you anyway, is I do a test for sharpness at what I call medium distance, about 15 to 20 feet, wide open at a 5.6. So I can get a sense of how the lens performs, if there's vignetting, how the sharpness is across the frame. I shoot a flat field. I shoot a bookshelf, if you're curious. Then I do what I call my bokeh slash minimum distance test, where I put each lens at its minimum focus distance with a large subject in the center of the frame and a bunch of different objects. I have metal objects, I have um, illuminated objects, and then just different squiggly things in the background so I can see how the bokeh is. So that gives me the ability to shoot all these 
in a row and see how they perform relative to each other. Someone's gonna ask me if they can have those files. Um, you can, they're pretty ugly, just pictures of our messy store, but, mm. um, and there's also like gigabytes of, of images, but yeah. um, my objective isn't to make pretty pictures. It's, it's sure David and I have shot all these lenses over the past many years, David longer than me, but when you can see how they all rendered next to each other the same day, the same time, of course, you can speak about it with a little bit more relevance. Um, and that's something that's really important to us when we, we do these Beats videos. So yeah, thank you sure. again, everybody. Thank you. Seriously, we appreciate it. Um, we know that it, you know getting the lens shipped out and all that is a hassle, so we are grateful. And of course, expect me to be bothering all of you again over the next month as we do 35 and 50. By the way, if you want to just send a 35 or 50 our if way. If anybody has you know. uh, 35 Sumalux version one, version two, um, 50 Doctolux 1.2, 50 Sumacron, dual range, rigid, Please, I will shout you out. I will give you a like a pin, whatever you want. <laughs> like it's uh, as you can see, we try to have everything on display and to show it, and uh, we yeah. appreciate the, we appreciate the help. We really it, do. it helps us really answer the questions. So I just had to say that. Yes. I was a ramble, but I'm really really grateful to everyone yeah, who helped us out. That was great, um, and we appreciate it. So I uh, think yeah, another shout out to LHSA, which is the International Leica Society. You can yes. check them out at lhsa.org, and I think they are still running their really awesome sweepstakes. I think so. Yeah. Is it still going on? I think. Ooh, somebody, somebody. I think I have Kirsten, a link. Anyone? <laughs> I believe if it is, I have yes. a link to it in the description below. Yes. And uh, they're giving away a grand prize of a M10 M10 monochrome. Sweet. But you know, you have to supply your own lens. But M10 monochrome, which is that's a really nice prize. I'll say. Hey, hey look, I like to say. Say. I got the logo. Thanks, Jose. Nice work. So uh, yeah, check them out. Um, I've been a member since 2006 and go to most of the meetings, which we do one in the spring and one in the fall. And they rotate around to different cities and we get to meet up with other photographers and take pictures. So yeah. it's a lot of fun. Check them out. I think we I think we did it. I think we did it. So um, again, big thank you to everyone who helped us out with this. Uh, thanks again always to our team, Jose, Kirsten, and Peter. We, uh, we can't do this without you guys. Big thanks to Josh. I probably could do this without him, but oh, you know, it'll be, it'll be a lot less interesting. The, the contest ended, so. Oh, the contest ended, never so mind. So we'll, we'll, be, we'll be providing the winner's full address, phone number, and name <laughs> online, so you can, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> sorry, next year. Sorry, They do it year. every year. They do. So, okay. They do. Sorry, David, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Uh, it's still worthwhile to join, even if you can't enter till next year, because there's gonna be a great prize next year, and there's still, you get uh, Viewfinder Magazine and other benefits. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay. Um, Big thank you to you guys for, for tuning in, uh, continuing to watch us in our 12th, 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 12th episode, episode of Red Dot yeah. Forum Camera Talk. Amazing. This has been uh, a lot of fun for us, and hopefully you guys are getting something out of it as well. And we're going to keep doing them. So next up is either 35 and 50. Uh, probably 35 millimeter. Uh, let's just say right now, I'm 90% sure it's going to be 35 millimeter. So. Yeah, like 87%, 35? I'm 90% sure. So 85? Stay tuned. Stay tuned. And subscribe if you want to be notified whether I actually posted. Absolutely. Do, so. Yeah, make sure to subscribe yeah. to, to Reddit Forum YouTube channel. Uh, click in down somewhere down here and hit the notification bell so you know when we go live and post new content. We actually do have some other videos, longer form videos that are not live that we'll be posting in the next week or so between our live videos. Mm -hmm. So you want to stay tuned for that. Got good a, stuff coming up, people. Good stuff. Seriously. If you're interested in Arte Damano cases, we have yes. a really cool yes. in-depth thing that yes. Kirsten did for us. Uh, so you're going to watch for out for that. And as always, head to uh, red.forum.com, the website for uh, the latest Leica news and reviews, tech articles, and all that. Um, thanks again to everyone. and. Uh, until uh, next episode, we'll see you then. Thanks, guys. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everybody.